Okay. Okay, at the break, he gets, he gets lunch, <laughs> even if I don't. Um, Clay and Ross and Julia, you all um, should have video capabilities with your link. And, and if you don't, please let me know. Everybody. Yeah, we'd love to see everybody if we can. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. How are you doing? Good morning, everybody. Hi, Char. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, hey, you guys. I'm... Oh, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure you had it. We were at one point. We'll get to a vote, and we'll need that thumbs up. It's good practice with your thumbs up. But I was prepared with my colors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Anna. We didn't feel like we should ask that everybody has young kids anymore or has their construction paper around. So we thought we would just keep it simple. But next time we know. I have no young kids, but I'm a sucker for colored post-it notes. So, you yeah. <laughs> know. Erin, I want to be where you are. She can't hear us yet. Where's the cat? Oh, you're muted. Scott Broman got a haircut. The cat is in the box, uh, and I muted because he was unhappy about being there for a moment. So we'll see. All right. If it's uh, if everyone is ready and we are live streaming on YouTube, I would like to call the Next Generation Commission meeting to order. Uh, if we want to put up the agenda. Molly, are you the one who's going to be handling the slides? Who's doing that? I'm driving the slides. Okay. Right. Are you seeing the agenda now? We sure are. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so let me start by just saying thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you. I hope you're staying safe and marginally sane in these crazy times. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Mission Critical Partners and my staff, Ryan Kirby, my Chief of Staff, and Abby Snyder, my ledge person, for, and my interns for all of the preparation and materials and uh, research. And Mission Critical is a great partner to us. So thank you to all the commissioners for engaging in our subcommittee meetings. We have been, each of the four subcommittees has been meeting every other week to uh, plow through and consider and vote on recommendations. Some of those will be voted on by the full commission today. Let me remind you that we are live streaming on YouTube. Uh, I have tweeted, um, feel free to retweet. We want to be very compliant with the open meetings law and make sure we are accessible to the press, to legislators, to public safety leaders, and to the general public. That video will remain on my YouTube channel, and again, anyone can watch it. My YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Sen Cheryl Kagan, so it's be easy to get to. If you have background noise, 
please mute. But other than that, feel free to stay unmuted if you're in a quiet space so that we can kind of have a conversation. But as a larger group, I will try to call on people. Um, and please keep your camera up for as much as you can. That will help us, especially as we were voting. And it will also help if you wanna speak, you can raise your hand either literally or through the, through the feature. There is a chat room um, that you can also share information or links. We are finding out from the attorney general whether that could be um, part of what could be disclosed if someone files a request for that. So let's assume that it will be public. So don't put anything in there that you wouldn't want on the front page of the Washington Post or Baltimore Sun. I can't imagine we're gonna be that fascinating, but I just want to suggest that. Um, there is uh, the meeting materials can be found. I'm gonna put the link in the, in the chat now. I will also read the link live. Um, actually, Ryan, you might be able to help me with some of this. Yeah, I can put that in the chat. Okay, so uh, thank you to the Office of Information System, the Maryland General Assembly for helping us with posting some of this material. It is at, it's bit.ly bit slash NG 911 MTG, and then today's date 102220. Uh, three twos. I was going to say that's not, I knew that wasn't right. 102220. Yes, thank you. All right, so that's the, that's the housekeeping stuff. Um, uh, I want to uh, launch by saying, by reminding everyone and thanking everyone of the importance of the work that we are doing, it's very exciting that there is now a national network show called Emergency Call that is featuring our, our 911 specialists and the incredible work they do. I want to give a special shout out to Tracy German, who is on the commission and who has been uh, working under the headset in Frederick County. Uh, while also doing this work. And uh, one of her colleagues is joining us as well. Uh, the pressures and stresses and challenges that these women and men face are extraordinary. And that is one of the things that we will be discussing and addressing today. This TV show, which apparently is getting great ratings, gives us some momentum and some opportunity to continue to educate Marylanders and others about the importance of our PSAPs, our public safety answering points, about our first first responders and about all the work that is done in our 911 centers. Uh, on August 20th of this year, every single county went text to 911 live. I wanna congratulate everyone who runs a 911 center, all the tech people, all the consultants and vendors, because that was an incredible accomplishment. Not many states have, have done that and gone all at once live. From the very beginning, this commission, we talked about all boats rise together and we accomplished that, all 24 jurisdictions, anywhere in the state, uh, residents and visitors will be able to call if they can, but text if they can't. And we wanna continue to put the word out on that. Text is a backup plan. It should never be the primary choice because calling is more efficient. We have now passed nine bills related to our work. Uh, this year, we have uh, we passed our omnibus bill that had a lot of our recommendations, as well as authorizing the state comptroller to perform audits. Uh, so that is no longer in the in the emergency number systems board's responsibility. Uh, on October first, we have also added transparency renamed the board to Maryland's 911 board, which just makes more sense. We've extended our work for two more years. We talked about uh, swatting. We will talk about all of this later and uh, as well as privacy of um, and trying to codify an attorney general opinion from a while ago. So we're not gonna go deep into that right now. I want to acknowledge that we have three new members of the commission. Randy Cunningham from Hereford County, who's a technology expert, has not just joined the commission with his expertise from his leadership on the 911 board, but also has stepped in for Bill Ferretti, who has retired, 
uh, and moved out of state. And uh, so Randy is now also chairing our technology and cybersecurity subcommittee. And Randy, thank you. Uh, Wayne Darrell from Kent County has stepped down from the 911 board and Scott Brillman has generously filled his shoes. Scott Brillman uh, is Baltimore City and on the 911 board and again brings uh, brings great expertise. So Captain Brillman, thank you for joining us. And then the awesome Clay Stamp uh, from Talbot County who has a, a wealth of background, credibility, relationships and knowledge uh, has also joined this commission and we are grateful for you coming on board. I think, uh, I think we have continue to have a really strong bunch of people in the room guiding our work. Unfortunately, we are losing two people who are on this call. And I just want to recognize briefly that two of our partners uh, from Mission Critical Partners um, are leaving us. And I am so sad about that because they have just been stalwarts and, uh, uh, and their wisdom has really made a difference and helped drive our work. So first, and I'm going to read both of these briefly, we will uh, mail these to the um, to you guys uh, if we get a current address. So I want to show that there is a Senate citation, and this the first one is for Nancy Pollock, who um, who was the staff person has been the staff person for the oversight and accountability subcommittee, which is a big lift, and uh, she's been amazing. The Senate of Maryland citation presented to Nancy Pollock in recognition of your dedicated service. Oh, I should have said, I'm a punster, so you will hear puns. In recognition of your dedicated service to the public safety of our state, your mission provided critical support as a partner to Maryland's Next Generation 911 Commission. Congratulations and best wishes on your retirement. We will miss working with you. Presented this day, October 22nd, by me, Cheryl Kagan, Maryland State Senator, District 17, Gaithersburg and Rockville, and chair of the Next Generation 911 Commission. Nancy, thank you. We are also losing, but for a much better reason, uh, we are losing Heather McGaffin, who um, I think I can now announce Heather. I think she has been sharing her news. And this is the citation for Heather. Uh, we are losing her to DC and she will be uh, working with Karima Holmes in their uh, operations center in Washington, D.C., and that is huge. And Heather has been uh, a wonderful to our clarity and to all of us on our staffing and training subcommittee and has just both of them just have extraordinary knowledge and, and patience with our process. So Heather, this is a citation from the Senate of Maryland to you, Heather McGaffin, Congratulations on your new mission in the Washington DC OUC. We are grateful for your critical support as a partner to Maryland's Next Generation 911 Commission. We wish you much continued success in your new position. Presented this day, October 22nd by me. Same signature stuff. So I'd like to, I'd like to uh, just congratulate you all. Um, if you all wanna, as a commission, do you all wanna, does anyone wanna briefly say anything? Uh, Shar and Chief Brooks, if either of you wanna add brief, brief words and then we can start our day. I would like to say that I will miss <clears throat> Heather greatly. Uh, she and I have thought processes that are the same, which allows us to be very effective as committee partners. And I think our collaboration efforts have moved this commission and our subcommittee forward um, in ways that we just can't describe. So Heather, thank you very, very, very much. Thank you, Shar. Chief Brooks, anything you wanna say about Nancy? Well, I will. Uh, can you hear me there? Yep. Oh, good. No, I wish, I wish them the best. Uh, ha have a great time. Gee, I, I'm, I'm curious as about how it uh, works. So uh, we can talk more about that later, but there's a whole life out there. Go enjoy it. There you go. And uh, Chief Brooks is going to be leaving us and uh, retiring as well. I have tried to, to legislation forbidding people 
Bill Castelli and Chief Brooks from retiring, but I have not yet uh, been able to do that. So, uh, so it's sad. We will say goodbye to Chief Brooks next month. Uh, with that, let me toss it to the Vice Chairman. Um, Mr. Souter, you are on as Josh Jack. You might want to rename yourself in the uh, You've got your name you. on there. Thank you, Senator. Uh, helping, working with Josh for doing that right now. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yes? I can. Okay, thank you. Uh, I echo everything you've said about the newcomers and the, uh, the ones that are leaving us, uh, but I want to take us in a slightly different direction. Uh, the last six months or so have been challenging to say the least for all Marylanders, and especially those in public safety, many of which are on this call and this commission. And I just want to personally thank each one of you for all that you've done above and beyond the call of duty uh, as Maryland continues to deal with this, uh, this tragic uh, illness that has affected the entire world. Thank you all. Thank you, Steve. I want to recognize that Delegate Sue Krebs and Delegate Michael Jackson are on this meeting, have been steadfast and focused and engaged members of this commission. As I said right before we started, Senator Riley is unable to join us today, but congratulates us on our work and uh, appreciates it. And will be, uh, he and I are going to talk in a couple of days so I can keep him updated. With that, um, let's, uh, let's go to the next item on the agenda. Okay, so we're going to do the quick go around. The question is how we do that since it's not going around the room. Uh, but yeesh. Okay, we want to do very uh, announcements. And Steve, I do want you to change your name if you can do that. Um, but Molly, do you have a recommendation as to how we can do that most efficiently? I can call on each name as I see them on my Zoom screen. And then if I miss anybody at the end, we capture them. That's perfect. Okay. Okay. So share, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing your name and your organization and then the committee uh, on which you serve, we will start with you, Senator Kagan. I am Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville and the chair of the Next Gen 911 Commission. Thank you. And I chair, and Mr. Structure. I chair the Finance and Structure Subcommittee. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Souter. Yes, ma'am. Uh, would introduce yourself and discuss which uh, subcommittee you participate on. Well, thank you very much. For all and, of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well said. Uh, it, it's just good to be back. Steve Souter, I don't need to introduce myself too much to you. You've been my friends for many years and my colleagues, and I just love working with you. And I'm glad that we're back moving forward. Uh, both as a subcommittee and as a committee and as a commission and in the service to Marylanders. Thank you so much. Okay. Tony Rose. Good morning. Tony Rose are. from the Charles County Department of Emergency Services, and I serve on the uh, Technology and Cybersecurity Subcommittee. And Colton O'Donohue. Uh, good morning. Um, I, um, my day job is at Verizon. I run the, uh, the engineering plan engineering team for Maryland, DC and Virginia. And I'm part of uh, Randy Cunningham's technology and cyber committee. Great. Speaking of Randy Cunningham. Good morning, Randy Cunningham. Uh, I work for Harvard County Department of Emergency Services. I'm a public safety manager, uh, managing all the technology aspect of the PTAP and the emergency uh, services department. I am the chair of the technology and cybersecurity subcommittee, as well as the ENSB, I'm sorry, 911 board member and uh, chairing that cybersecurity subcommittee as well. Great. Thank you. Shar Flaherty. Good morning. I am Charlene Flaherty. I'm I work for Prince George's County Office of Homeland Security, Public Safety Communications, and I'm the chair of the Staffing and Training Subcommittee. And I'm really happy to be here and proud to serve. Jonathan Seaman. Hi, uh, Jonathan Seaman. I'm the director of budget finance and IT for Queen Anne's County, and I'm on the finance and structure subcommittee. Great. Anna Sierra. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Anna Sierra. I'm the Director of Emergency Services for Caroline County. And on the commission, I represent the Eastern Shore Communications Alliance, all nine counties of the Eastern Shore. Um, I am on the Finance and Structure Subcommittee. Thank you. Scott Roper. You yeah, Scott Roper. Okay. I'm, if you I'm all can please director. all unmute, it will go faster. Sorry, Scott, go ahead. Yes, yeah, Scott Roper, Executive Director of the Maryland 911 Board, and I sit on the Finance and Structure Subcommittee. Great, thank you. Scott Brillman. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Scott Brillman from the City of Baltimore, 911 Director. Um, I uh, sit on the 911, the newly named 911 Board, and I also sit on the Finance and Structure Committee uh, for the 911 Commission. Great, thank you. Clay Stamp. Hey. Greetings, uh, Clay Stamp. I'm representing Talbot County. Honored to be on the commission. Thank you for inviting me, Senator. I look forward to participating with you. I'm very new, so the Senator is going to tell you what committee I'm on. <laughs> you are on the, uh, the ONA committee, the Oversight and Accountability, Clay. And looking forward to the work. Thank you. There. Perfect. Thank you. Aaron? Aaron Chair-Smith from Baltimore City, uh, and I serve on the Finance and Structure Subcommittee. Great, thank you. Chairman Myers. Yes, uh, good morning, Anthony Myers. I represent the Chairman of the um, Maryland Public Service Commission, Jason Stanick on the commission, and I serve on the Oversight and Accountability uh, so Committee, and I'm also part of the uh, Maryland 911 Board. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Delegate Krebs? Sue, you're, you're unmuted. Yeah. Sue I thought unmuted. I'm sorry, Susan Krebs from Carroll County. Uh, I serve as delegate and I serve on the Health and Government Operations Committee where all of this legislation goes and I'm on the Oversight Committee of the, of the board. Uh, delegate Jackson. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Delegate Jackson, uh, representing Prince George's and Calvert, a colleague of Shar in my real life, uh, uh, serve on the Appropriations Committee in Annapolis and Technology and Cyber. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chief Brooks. Good morning, thank you, Richard Brooks. I'm with the Department of Emergency Services in Cecil County, Maryland. Some say Cecil County if they're south of the C&D Canal. And I am the uh, subcommittee chair of oversight and accountability. Great, thank you. And Julia Fisher. Good morning, this is Julia Fisher. I work for the Maryland Department of Information Technology. I sit on the commission as a representative for the secretary of that department. Um, I also am a representative of the geographic information systems community and a Maryland 911 board member. Uh, and I sit on the technology and cybersecurity subcommittee for this commission. Thank you, Kevin Canale. Hi, thank you, Kevin Canale with the Maryland Association of Counties. Um, I sit, I listen in on all the subcommittees. My executive director, Michael Sanderson has been covering the finance subcommittee and he'll be on later, but thank you all for being here and excited to get started. Great. And Sean Looney. Good morning, uh, Sean Looney. I'm Senator Kagan's driver and bodyguard. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I'm from Comcast, NBC Universal. I've been involved with this uh, amazing effort since its uh, very beginning. And uh, I'm on the finance subcommittee. Yay. Great. Thank you. Did Cecilia, did I, I thought I saw Cecilia on. Did, are you still on, Cecilia? Yes, I am. This is Cecilia Warren from Maryland Department of Disabilities. Good morning. I serve on the Technology and Cyber Committee, but I also lurk on the Accountability <laughs> Committee. I have a keen interest in um, the activities that they're doing also. Thank you. Great, thank you. And are there any other commission members that are not on video that I don't see that I have missed? Uh, this is Tracy German. I'm a manager at Frederick County Emergency Communications, and I'm on the Staffing and Training Subcommittee. Okay, thank you. 
Anyone else? All right. And I think uh, we don't want to go without introducing, without giving Ryan an opportunity to introduce himself. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Ryan Kirby, Senator Kagan's Chief of Staff, and I have been on the Staffing and Training Subcommittee. And mission critical, Should, can we do a quick, let's introduce you, fabulous. Would you like us? Yeah. Sure. Uh, Molly Falls, the project manager from for mission critical for the, the overall uh, commission project. Josh Jack? Yeah, uh, Josh Jack, mission critical partners, and I support the tech and cyber subcommittee. Great, thanks. Karen Henry? Good morning, I'm Karen Henry from Mission Critical Partners. Um, I will be joining the um, Oversight and Accountability Subcommittee. I'm new and I'm excited to uh, work with this group and collaborate, thank you. Nicole Unger? Good morning, I'm Nicole Unger with Mission Critical Partners. I'm sort of a pinch hitter wherever I'm needed today, but I'll also be participating with the uh, staffing and training subcommittee. Thanks. Heather McGaffin. Hi, good morning, Heather McGaffin and I support training and staffing subcommittee. Thank you. And Sherry. Good morning, Sherry Griffith Powell and I support the Senator on the finance and structure and I also support Chief Brooks on oversight and accountability subcommittee. Superwoman. <laughs> Great. Uh, Nikki Tidy. Hi, good morning. Um, I will also be supporting the training and staffing committee trying to fill Heather's big shoes that she's leaving. Thank you, Nikki. Good to have you back. And Nancy. Hi, everyone. Nancy Pollock. I am uh, really serving wherever I'm needed. I'm supporting uh, still the ONA committee. Um, uh, helping Sherry and Molly whenever is necessary. Thanks very much, Senator, for your citation and your um, acknowledgement. I appreciate it. You're awesome. You guys are all amazing. Did I miss anybody, Chad? Are you still on? I am, and I apologize for not broadcasting. I'm having some internet stability issues. I'm a senior technical specialist, and I'm supporting Josh Jack and the Tech and Cyber Committee. Thank you, Chad. Uh, Molly, you might have missed Ross Coates. Unless I miss Ross. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Ross Coates. Yeah. I am the manager for the Harford County 911 Center and also serve as the chairman of the Maryland Association of Counties Emergency Management Affiliate Emergency Communications Committee. Great. Thank you. Is there anyone else we missed? I'm oh, sorry. We do have people who have been engaged and who will participate um, in our subcommittee breakouts, uh, but I really wanna get started with our work. I just wanna acknowledge again, mission critical partners, uh, Molly, Sherry, Heather, Josh, especially the last several days preparing for this meeting with all of my edits and feedback and all the feedback they've gotten from others uh, have really put in the hours. So we are grateful. With that, let's uh, let's really get started. I want to give you the rhythm of the day. I want to put back the uh, uh, the agenda or something, or Molly, whatever you think is next. We do have some brief presentations. Then we are going to break out into subcommittees where we will continue discussing some of the recommendations to the the full commission. We will have a five minute break, but we really need to drive this fast. We try to start on time and end on time, and have succeeded in that. Um, after the subcommittee breakouts where you should be eating lunch and, and all that, we'll have a brief break, come back into the full commission, present for each of the four subcommittees, and, uh, and then we will have votes. And, uh, and then we are working ultimately towards our third annual report, which will be released in December with recommendations in the past. We're talking about 60 something pages and 20 something recommendations that have been incorporated into legislation. And uh, so that is our end goal. So when they say start with the end in mind, that's what we are focused on. And this is the making sausage uh, to get to that point. With that, Molly, I toss it to you to, uh, to help start our presentations and get the right person in the room. Absolutely. So uh, we have a couple of updates 
and financial updates, and then a GIS presentation. So first things first, uh, Mr. Scott Roper, uh, I've got you on for just to help provide a funding update. And I have that, that chart that you provided for the next slide, if you would like to give us an update. Yeah, so I, I provided a couple charts. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to read off the spreadsheets that I have because it's just easier for me. Um, so in comparison of FY 2019 versus FY 20 in total for the... Um, the, the, the county 91 fee, the, the wireline um, percentage went up by about 33.44%. The wireless is which we had our biggest increase, um, went up 70.25%. And that, that jumped from about 22.6 million to 38.5 million. Um, prepaid remained relatively the same. Um, so it did trend up just a little bit. And in total, um, we've seen a 49.24% increase in uh, pass-through funds going to the county PSAPs. And that's very county by county, um, as you're aware, or this group should be aware, that the fees are um, passed through in the same proportion of which they're collected. So every dollar, or actually now dollar twenty-five that gets collected in Baltimore City, uh, 75 cents of that goes back to Baltimore City. Um, every you know dollar 25 that gets collected in Dorchester County, 75 cents of that goes back to Dorchester County, and the remaining 50 cents goes into the 911 Trust Fund to fund enhancements to 911. So, in FY20, the board awarded um, roughly 28.5 million um, in County awards, uh, every county um, received some, some money uh, of that. About 20 million went to eight phone systems. Uh, about 460,000 went to 91 specialist training. Uh, 2.5 million went to mapping. Um, the, our newest category, uh, which is maintenance recurring charges, which are only eligible for about half the fiscal year. That was about 3.3 million. And then we had 745,000 in next generation implementation. In total, uh, the board funded 297 individual funding requests for the counties. And just looking at the current fiscal year, through our um, September board meeting, the board's funded in um, enhancements for 911 service in 113 individual funding requests, including two phone systems. 13 and a third million dollars, which um, on average is about what we typically fund during um, a fiscal year up to uh, FY 2020. So when the fee was set at a quarter, um, typically, and we didn't have the maintenance cost, typically we funded about 13.3 million on average on a fiscal year. So we've already done that in the first quarter of this year. And I think that just about wraps up the fiscal reporting. Thank you very much, Mr. Roper. Are there brief questions for Mr. Roper, the director of the 911 board? Okay, seeing none. Next item. Uh, Senator, the, the ne next item on the list or on our agenda was the, um, the office of the comptroller and I don't believe they are on today. Correct, so I am presenting the memo that was sent to me this morning. I had spoken to the comptroller's office last week asking for um, something in writing that I could share with you all. I'm going to read you just two or three sentences. Um, as you all, as I reported earlier, um, we passed an emergency bill to authorize the state comptroller to audit <coughs> the Roper just gave. And it does it's the best use of the 911 board's uh, limited staff and, uh, and accounting skill to have them try to, to check with all of the um, uh, telecommunications providers and all that um, about whether they're paying the right amount, whether it's coming in correctly, and then whether it's going out correctly. So the comptroller will be doing that. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, for some reason, and frankly, I don't understand it, um, the comptroller is forbidden from uh, handling audits. I'm gonna read you 
there's a four paragraph and I'm happy to share it publicly, um, but I'm just gonna read you half of paragraph one. Uh, as previously mentioned, due to current restrictions imposed as a result of the current pandemic, our division is currently not starting any new audits, finalizing any audits previously started, or assessing any liabilities determined as a result of an audit for any tax or fee type. When the current restrictions are lifted plus 30 days, we will resume all collection activities, which would of course include 911 fee audits. So I wanted to share that with you all. What that means is that, uh, is that the numbers that Mr. Roper shared, we think, we hope are accurate, but they are unaudited numbers, the, the data could change. So um, we will see what, uh, what that looks like. I wonder whether there is anyone who shares my concern or perplexment, if that's a word, as to why the comptroller would be forbidden from doing any audits during uh, during the pandemic, and is that something that this commission wants me or or as a commission to look into and learn more about? Happy to hear from any commissioner. Yes, Delegate Jackson. Uh, yes, yeah, Senator, uh, I, I join uh, whatever that new word you just created. Um, okay. You know, I, I, I have no idea why that would be the case, but, um, you know, their budget comes through, uh, through the uh, appropriations committee and I certainly will be glad to work with you and uh, to try to find out why I mean I don't know who would bar them from doing this uh, I think I believe that's under the purview of the comptroller but glad to work with you on that okay Delia Krebs is that something you'd like to be a part of um, I would just tell you that the private sector everyone is working they're working remotely they're still doing audits my son is in you know, that field. They work every day. In fact, they're working overtime. So I do not know why uh, the public sector can't be doing the same. I mean, you can do many things. They don't have to go physically to a location. There's no reason this work cannot be being done. Is there anyone on the commission who objects to the four legislators, assuming that Senator Riley wants to join on also? Would it be okay if we, the four of us wrote a letter to the governor, CC the comptroller, our perplexment, our concern uh, about the lack of audits going on during during the pandemic, and writing it on behalf of not just ourselves but the commission. Is there? And if they're not, and if they're not able to do it through um, means, they need to find people that are able to do it because it, it's being done everywhere. I mean, this is that's absurd. Right. <laughs> Sorry. So you know what? Rather than asking for a negative, can I get thumbs up? Thumb. We'll do a thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, may we invoke the commission as as querying about this thumbs up if you say yes that's okay write a letter looking Senator, this is anthony myers uh i, I will uh stay for that vote because of uh representing a, a sister age yep that's fine uh can yeah, we just be sure i will take critical the is as the chairman counting. okay julia no chief brooks aaron i saw you vote clay Anyone else, uh, Tracy, since you're not, okay, thumbs up here. Um, I'm gonna read votes aloud that, that can't. Uh, Ms. Kevin Canale, anyone else? Okay, any thumbs down? Thumbs down, don't write the letter on behalf of the commission. Okay, we will draft something and, uh, and we will share that with you all, but we will draft it on behalf of the commission. Thank you. Moving on to the next presentation. So yes, Senator, Senator, let me, I know we are, Oh, go ahead, Sean. I just wanted to mention that, uh, and maybe Scott can answer this one. Representing Comcast, obviously. Um, Scott, do you foresee any issue with the major carriers providing accurate accounting of, of the funds and all that? And would it be, you know, however this plays out, it may take a while to figure this out with the controller's office. So would it be appropriate for Scott Roper to just say, Hey, common carriers, just touch and base, making sure you don't have any issues or concerns about 911 fees collection and uh, you know paying the commissions. Just kind of reach out to make sure that there's not a, a problem out there. Yeah. So um, my office just sent a correspondence to the carriers about six weeks ago, maybe. 
uh, I forget the exact date, but just advising them of the change to the administrative fee that the um, the carriers can hold on to for the processing of the the fee collection remittance. And I haven't heard anything back from any of them of any concern about okay. any of the fees or collections. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question. But, but uh, yeah, that's part of it. But... All. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I've yeah, been Andrew. in touch with all of them, all 211 okay. of them since the uh, start of September. Okay. Including well, the major I'll, accounting firms that, that do the work. Okay. Good. And you've not heard of any major concerns or anything. So that, that's, I think that's yeah. comforting to hear. And I will proactively just reach out to my 911 people, make sure that they don't have any issues because. You know, if, if they have any issues, that means others must have issues too. But I'm not heard a word from them, so I'm thinking that everything is okay. But uh, maybe we can just do an informal temperature check to make sure that there aren't any problems out there short of getting the audits completed. Yeah, and I, I'd just like to add to that. This is, this is actually an independent audit done by the controllers. They do the sales tax and use. The, um, the collections that we get are done monthly on a, a collection form. Um, that, that's submitted to the controller with their with each uh, vendor's payment. And those are each validated by my staff. Um, so it's obvious if, if they're not collecting the right amount because they're using the old form. So we, we had a, a, a bumpy start for maybe the first two months of this, uh, of the, the revised fee, but I, we should pretty much have that all smoothed out by now. Uh, Steve Souter Thank here. you for the uh, question, Steve. Yes, please, Steve. Scott, to, 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 uh, a simple question, and, and I don't want to confuse this question with a full-blown audit, but if each carrier was requested to identify how many subscribers they have and to also tell you how much they remitted to the state most recently, to me, there would be a simple correlation between the subscriber number and the amount that was remitted based upon a dollar and 25 cent fee. Is that, is that something that we would feel comfortable in asking you to do? Uh, is it something that you think they could easily provide? Um, one, I, I don't know that I currently have the statutory authority to do that. And two, um, in all likelihood, they were point to the form that they've already submitted. Well, the form, we're not privy to the form right now, but does the form ask those two things? The, 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 the form identifies the number of um, 911 accessible services by the 24 counties and the amount collected. And I guess, does that correlate with the number of subscribers and, and the fee that they're remitting? Very simply. So that, that would correlate to the number of, of we we're not using really the term subscriber anymore, but 9-1 accessible services and the money that they collect, yes, that would be on the form by county. Okay, thank you. And that, that form's available on our website if anybody wants to look at it. Okay. Okay, okay. so I'd like to move on if we could. Um, Jim Marshall is a nationally known uh, leader in this field. Julia Fisher was about to be up next, but, um, but Julia, if it's okay, we're gonna switch the order because Mr. Marshall has a really brief window of availability. Is that okay with you? Uh, that is fine. I would, if I can go before the breakouts because I have some information that will help drive the conversations during the breakout session. That is very helpful. So Molly, if that's okay, okay you guys, that works for me. Well, let's talk through this then. I think, so Jim's window is at 1245. So then if we, oh. if we need to go before the breakouts, we'll just have to kind of split our breakouts or something like that. So, um, and we can let Julia go now. I'm sorry. I thought you were indicating that, that Jim needed to go now. No, sorry. He needs to go at 1245. So I was trying to give us time. I missed. Okay. I apologize. Okay. Julia is next. Let me just um, proceed Julia by saying, first off, she is super smart. Uh, one of the key aspects of next generation 911 
is GIS, the Geographic Information System. Um, a lot of you have heard that I had three people, I've had three people die in my district when 911 failed. And one of them was due to data and not being able to locate the, sort, the location, find the emergency. And so Julia spends her life working on making sure that doesn't happen again. So because she's super smart, sometimes she uses acronyms. I'm hoping that doesn't happen. And I'm hoping that we can have this conversation in a way that observers, the press, the general public, and those of us who are experts at GIS can, can follow, <laughs> follow along. So Julia, thank you very much. Um, and go ahead. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate your uh, introduction. And yes, I, I have to continually remind myself, I, I live, I breathe this stuff, um, and the rest of you do not. Um, and so, yes, I will try to take a lot of the tech out of my talk. Um, but if anyone ever wants to get together and geek out, you let me know, because I'm all for it. So uh, for those of you who may be new to the conversation, I just wanted to take a moment and make sure that it was very clear to all of you what the role of GIS, Geographic Information Systems, is within the next generation 911 efforts. So um, really, it, GIS is at the core of NextGen 911. So the location of the caller is fundamental to 911 systems. And so utilizing GIS, we can provide the ability to capture and analyze the location of people and places within the physical world. So it's a really, really powerful tool. Uh, Marilyn, we have a long history of using GIS to provide products and services to assist in capturing, analyzing, and presenting data linked to a location. And we've used it in many industries. It continues to be used in many industries, but also has been used very successfully for public safety. And this is just another example of how GIS is being applied within the public safety community. Uh, so the Maryland GIS community specifically, we also have decades of collaborative work. And that has been toward common goals. And with NextGen 911, that is no different. So I just want to take a moment and say I am humbled and honored to be a part of the GIS community within the state of Maryland. I speak with colleagues all over the country and Maryland is a group of professionals who are passionate and dedicated to utilizing GIS to change for the, for the good. And there is no higher calling really than to assist in doing so within public safety and within 911 in particular. So um, next slide. All right, so I know the Senator sees this and she's like, oh God, Julia, please, no, please. All I wanted to say is I wanted to give you a glimpse of how our brains are working. I'm not gonna go into the details. I just want to make you aware that this is our readiness progression diagram. So these are all the parts and pieces that those of us within GIS are either educating ourselves about because not all of us have a public safety background um, or taking the knowledge that we have with, within the GIS community and marrying that information together to progress towards a successful nine, next gen 911 launch and implementation and maintenance. So if you are interested, we do have a Maryland Next Generation 911 Geographic Information System Strategic Plan that was delivered to the Maryland 911 Board in late 2019 that is available. And it has um, a ton of information. This diagram is included. It breaks it down because we understand 
that the implementation of GIS for NG911 is very complex. And so we decided we wanted to get organized. So we have a plan. We developed it with input from subject matter experts throughout the public and private sector. And it outlines all the tasks that need to be completed to assemble a state level GIS program focused on meeting the needs of the public safety community in Maryland. Um, again, this plan, it outlines each task and the GIS community is working diligently and methodically through each of these tasks. So today, uh, I just wanted to bring before the commission some information specifically regarding our latest objectives. And I just wanted to also thank you for the opportunity so I can emphasize that partnerships and communication that has been established and continues to grow are benefiting all of the communities involved in this migration to NextGen 911 in Maryland. So next slide. All right, and with that being said, I think that some of the biggest concepts, and this is not just for GIS, that might be a technical uh, component, but it really comes down to coordination, collaboration, and consolidation. And, you know, you wanna call it CCC, whatever. But, so this is vital. We found that this is vital within the GIS community so in order for us to be able to deliver systemic and sustainable solutions, whether they're for public safety, regardless of who they're for. And again, the Maryland GIS community, we're making every effort to contribute these sustainable and systemic solutions, systemic meaning statewide. We wanna make sure to the Senator's point, all boats rise together. And so we wanna ensure that the technology and the capabilities and the resources that are available in a very robust, large, uh, abundant uh, county are the same resources that are made available to even a less populated, a smaller, uh, a county with a smaller budget. Um, because ultimately, we all need to be able to serve, equally serve all Marylanders um, with these vital services. So a little bit of background within the GIS community, if I can go another step further. Um, starting all the way back in 2009 was a formal establishment of One Maryland, One Map, which is our Maryland Integrated Map, or what we call MDI Map. This program has continued to grow and be managed out of the Geographic Information Office, so out of my office. Um, and it, from day one, and continues to be dedicated in guiding and coordinating interagency and intergovernmental efforts. So we are not strictly focused, we never have been strictly focused on just supporting other state agencies. It is um, state, regional, county, municipal organizations. We partner with the private sector, we partner with academia, with nonprofits as well as the federal government and at a national level and the public. So that has always been a very broad objective. And I just wanted to make sure that you understand that that's the foundation that the state is bringing to help coordinate, collaborate and consolidate this effort. All right, so I'm being moved along. Sorry, Julia. We really, we, we gotta, we gotta start time. to wrap up. Yeah, sorry, Julia. No problem. I wanted to show you a recent achievement of that coordination, collaboration, and consolidation within the GIS community. So you'll see the diagram on the left. These are the original two boundaries. So there are two jurisdictions that border each other. I mean, obviously, it, there is, you know, gaps. There's, it's unclear as to whether or not, you know, are they going to include the peer? Are they not going to include the peer? And through communication and use of collaborative technology, 
both jurisdictions now have a very clear delineated boundary. They are now agreed to that boundary. They have made a decent buffer away from the shoreline so that it is very clear who is responsible for what. So again, this is happening all over the state. I'm proud to announce that all the PSAP boundaries for the state of Maryland have been agreed upon and we do have the first official PSAP boundary layer available. So big, that's, that's, that was a big milestone. Mm -hmm. So our, our current GIS focus has now turned to these non-traditional locations. Um, many of you are aware that there was an incident over the summer uh, between the borders of Montgomery and Loudoun counties. And unfortunately, uh, the incident ended in the loss of a young person's life. So um, multiple jurisdictions are actually coming together within the national capital region and developing a river atlas. So that's going to include commonplace names, which is wonderful. But we realize that we need to look at this systemically statewide. So we're talking as a community about statewide adoption of data standards for, for all these non-traditional locations. So as you can see, there are examples there. I'm at the park, I'm in the airport, I'm at the coffee shop, I'm in building four. These are all real calls that the call takers receive. And we within the GIS community are going to find ways in order to capture this information to assist with getting the resources to the caller faster, getting that call in faster, getting their location identified faster, getting the resources out faster. Okay. Next slide. Thanks. All right, so what does this all look like? Um, well, the reality is, is that Maryland has a multi ESINET environment is the reality, um, which does make collaboration, coordination, and consolidation between systems paramount, um, but much more challenging. So we can create systems to be designed and run and, and really do whatever we want them to do, um, but data and standards must be established and must be followed in order to achieve success. So you'll see a few recommendations today, which will address some of these items. Um, the efforts rely on the flexibility of all the communities, GIS, PSAP, Public Safety Answering Point communities, and the vendor communities to develop and adopt uh, additional data and standards to change together to better the 911 response process. So it is still uh, a mountain to climb, but uh, I know that with your support, uh, we'll be able to accomplish anything. So thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for that. And thank you for keeping it in English for those of us who are not experts at this. And thank you again for all you do. Uh, Ms. Fisher referenced uh, the loss of Fitz Thomas, the really tragic loss, and I'm sure you've all heard about it, heard the 911 calls and read about it. Dan Morris in the Washington Post did a great job of covering it, and that and situations like the one in my district and many, many others are what we need to, to um, and what her work will continue to avoid. We have to rush into our breakout centers, uh, breakout rooms now. Jim Marshall has a very narrow window. We have 15 minutes of his time and we can't be late. So we must be back into this room at 1245. Um, so if, if I'm gonna propose, can we go directly into breakouts right now, have a solid 45 minutes, 44 minutes, come back here, we'll have 15 minutes of, of Mr. Marshall and then we'll take our break. Can we do that? Molly, does that work for you all? So we'll take our break then at one o'clock from one to one ten or something. So let's plow through a little bit longer. If you need to take a bio break, but let's go straight into the breakout rooms. So if that's okay, I will see you back here promptly 1245 for Jim Marshall. It's gonna be a very important presentation. Uh, so we will be closing this room. Molly, do you wanna just run through exactly how this is gonna work, please? 
Holly's audio is not working. Okay, so uh, Sherry, Nancy, Josh, who wants to tell us how this is going to work? Yeah, so on the screen, um, you see some blocks. Um, so if you are finance instructor, oversight and accountability, um, you'll be with Sherry. Um, the link is there, and you should have also received that um, if you are a if you are a member to that uh, to any of these subcommittees, you should have received the link separately in your email. Um, these, of course, are open um, to, to folks who would like to join. Uh, of course, when it comes to decision making, that'll be left up to commission members. So um, finance and structure, oversight and accountability, you'll be together. Um, technology and cyber, you'll join Josh and Chad and Karen, uh, you'll be together and staffing and um, training, you'll, you'll be with, with me. Um, if you have any questions or if you have any issues, um, just send Molly a note in chat and she'll be able to uh, direct you to the right place. And for people who are following uh, on YouTube, let me just say that the subcommittee breakouts are not going to be live streamed on YouTube. We are going to be having conversations, but you are welcome to come into any of these rooms and observe. Uh, so just as you would walk into a room and observe, that's just fine. But the live streaming will resume promptly at 1245. With that, see you on the other side, leaving now. Thank you. Hey, put them on chat. Yeah, they put them on chat. That's how I joined it. Oh, okay. Got a guy, yeah. Okay.
Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. So how uh, did you see the, I shared the link for the oversight and accountability um, meeting in the chat function. So if you go up to the top and you um, click chat, then you'll be able to hop into the, um, the finance and structure slash oversight and accountability meeting there. It's got Sherry, that link to access Sherry's um, go-to meeting account. Do you see that? Mm -mm. Okay, did you get the agenda from her last night? Here, I'll just send you all an email. Okay. And then you, it, cause we're using a different platform for, for the uh, breakout session. Do you see the link in the chat feature? If you go up to the top and you click more, those three buttons, and then you click chat, it'll be in there. I don't see where it says more. Uh, okay. It says Molly falls to all panelists and then there's a link. I think yeah. we're already on the link. Oh, so, so, you're on the, so you click that link for finance and structure. Am I the only one hearing two conversations going on at one time? Um, I only hear one. Okay. I only hear I one. Did. All right. Are you on the finance and structure meeting? Yes. So then yep, you can drop sure. off this Zoom link and just okay. join that for now. And then we'll rejoin this in 45. Steve, do you see that? I'm trying to. Oh, for some, did you get it? No. It's... Yeah, Clay can't get in either. I, I he just texted me. Okay, I mean, I'm, I can hear you. I just can't see what you're telling us to look at. I can hear you. Yeah, I'm gonna. I have to close out of this because I cannot get to my emails while I'm in Zoom, and I'm gonna send you the link to the breakout session. So, but I have to, it's not allowing me to access to. Then how um, do we do, will we have to go into our email then and do the same thing? Yeah, so close out of the Zoom session and then you're gonna go to a go-to meeting. So, which is the platform that we used before. Brooks, we can't hear you.
Chief Ricks and Steve, can you, did you see, can you hear me? Did you see my, I sent you an email with the link to the go-to webinar. Oh. So Chief Ricks, I just sent you an email with um, the access to the other meeting. And Steve, I did for you as well. And let me, um, let me see if I can unmute you. Um, I would ask that the term special be removed um, in disability culture. There we go. Can you hear me, Molly? I can. Okay. So I'm hearing the whole meeting I'm supposed okay. to be in. Uh -huh. They can't see me or hear me. Uh, the senator thinks I'm signed off. I'm looking okay. at you and Steve Souter, and we're having a conversation. Okay, you drop off of this Zoom link for, for and go to that, and then you can turn your video on for the GoTo meeting. And then, okay. so you can just bug out from talking with I'm, me and go talk to them. Yeah, I'm just gonna drop out of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Planning mm -hmm. and people with disabilities. And so um, we feel that Steve, same for you. Can you just, you just drop out of Zoom and then they can see you on video and they will be able to hear you on the go to meeting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to cut in for a second. One of the things that the, that I've been taught in politics over the years is don't don't sell past the past the purchase. Or I'm Sean. There's something like that. Don't don't keep don't keep pushing. Like it might be that there's not a conflict here and we might be able to move forward. So we can answer Got questions. It. Let me just indicate that the word special is not on this chart, which is the what is before us. The word that okay. we with on my subcommittee is accessibility representative. And to be clear, yeah. encompasses the disability uh, community as well. This is Molly. Hey, Jim, how are you? I am, yes. How are things going for you? Shh. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Oh,
Hi, Jim. Can you hear me? I can, Molly. Can you hear me? I can. Perfect. Good deal. <clears throat> I think everyone was wrapping up their subcommittee meetings and taking a quick break, and then we'll all be back on here shortly. Awesome. I see Steve is on. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me? He's muted. I don't know if he's on another call still or not. Okay, all right. Oh, there he is. He presented by Chief Brooks and me to the full commission. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to keep him muted because they're finishing up their subcommittee. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just delighted he's a part of this today. Mm -hmm. It's good. Uh, and Will I, no, it's okay for me to talk. We're not interrupting them, right? Or are we? No, you're not. Well, maybe Steve might be hearing two conversations at one point in time now, at, one, at the same time, but you're okay. Okay. I just want to confirm that I can jump in to do screen share as I usually would, right? Um, you don't have to give me permission. I can just hit screen, uh, share screen and go from there. You should be able to, yes. Okay. All right. Let me check my screen here. Oh, this will stop the other screen share. Okay, so I don't want to do that. Cancel. Yeah, just we'll just hold on and then you'll be able to share. Absolutely. That's fine. Thank you. you bet. Hey, Anna. Oh, hey, Anna. Molly, can you hear me? I can. I, Who was that? You, Nancy? Okay. All right. <sighs> We're getting there. We are getting there. Are we live streaming yet? No. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, we are. Okay. 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 Sorry. All right. Um, so, can we assume that everybody has the? We're at half capacity right now. Jim Marshall, you are a busy guy that we are able to squeeze moments of your time here. So thank you for your flexibility. Um, we have commissioners who are joining. Uh, MCP, can you help make sure that all of our commissioners know how to get back in um, so that we can be at full strength? And to anyone watching the live stream, we are waiting. We are having one more presentation and then the four subcommittees will be reporting to the full commission their recommendations. We're just going to give it a moment because we are still short on commissioners. Tracy, are you at, are you under the headset right now? Are you on the clock or are you at home on your own time? She may have had to walk away. She she shared with us that she's at the center in a conference room, but has to keep going back out to the floor to check on things. Of course. Okay. I am hoping that she's going to be able to join us for this presentation because it's amazing. Well, we don't know if we can quite live up to that, but we'll do our best, Senator. And <laughs> no pressure, pleasure. Jim. No pressure. By the way, I want to be clear that the appreciation is reciprocal. I'm very grateful for the, the privilege of doing this um, because it indicates such an investment on the part of the people on the commission and, and those who are with us as stakeholders. So. Thank you. All right. So I want to see Chief Brooks. I want to see Tony Rose. I want to see, let's see, do we see Shar? Yes. Anna, yes. 
Let's give it just another 60 seconds here. I hope the subcommittee breakouts were successful. Shar and Heather, you were able to get through some stuff. So excited about that. All right. And Josh and Randy, do we have Randy yet? How did tech and cybersecurity go? Maybe they're still talking. Mission critical, are they still meeting? Are they on their way back? I will check in on that with them. Okay, I don't see either of them here yet. And, and Senator, just so you know, I do have flexibility now. I had something open up a little bit, so I don't want you to feel like you have to, to race on this. Take your time. <laughs> Thank you. All right, looks like we are getting uh, folks coming back into the room. All right. So I think we should start, Molly, or do you want to do anything else before we, maybe I'll kill time with just giving a glimpse of the rest of the afternoon. Is that a good use of our time? That, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so. It sounds like Josh and Randy just are wrapping up, so they'll be on shortly. Okay, so we have a presentation. I'll do the official introduction in a moment, but we have Jim Marshall who will be speaking to the full commission. We will then have reports from the four subcommittees on their work and what they have accomplished to date in all of their past meetings, as well as at today's breakout session. Um, if there is a need, right, Molly, we might go back into breakouts or we don't need to do that so much. What's I guess I'll leave that to you all. We will, I mean, if there's a need to go back, um, if we're going to do that, I will want a heads up and I will send everybody a meeting invitation with the respective subcommittee breakouts. But I think, I mean, it depends on how far we get with, I don't know that we'll have time. Okay. I think that's probably true. Can you just put, before we go to Jim, will you just put the full day's committee agenda up again, just so people can gauge that? Thank you, yep, okay. So that's just the glimpse at today um, and what we've got left. So presentation and questions. Um, we also uh, cut Julia Fisher a little short. I don't know she, whether she's back with us, but if there were questions on GIS, um, maybe we can take a couple of minutes if someone could contact her and make sure that her schedule allowed her to come back in case there were GIS questions. Julia, I'm talking about you. Um, so if there were questions about your presentation, since we had to jump short to accommodate Jim Marshall's schedule, uh, I wanna make time for that if there are questions about that. Okay, with that, I see uh, we're at 34. Um, so if you could go back, Molly, to the slide for Jim. So as we get to that place, first off, let me thank you all for your indulgence in crazy technology and hopping in and out of uh, Zoom rooms and chat rooms and meetups and all that. It's a headache and it sure would be better if we were all in the, uh, in the uh, Department of Legislative Services building and able to just go and get sandwiches together and chat in the hallway, but that is not to be. The plus side is we get to hear from people that we would never otherwise have access to. And I will tell you, you've got the graphic on the screen, but I am gonna show you some of my bedtime reading for the last couple of weeks has been this book and I am learning so much. Um, Jim Marshall is, uh, is an extraordinary thought leader. His sister was a 911 specialist as we call them in Maryland by law and his awareness, sensitivity and creative problem solving as to how we can support these sheroes and heroes including our own Tracy German, who's on this commission uh, in the extraordinary work that they do. And uh, Jim, you didn't get to hear me give a shout out to Heather McGaffin, who is leaving to work in DC. We are sad about that. She brings incredible expertise and her leadership along with uh, subcommittee chair, Char Flaherty, whom you've met before in Prince George's County uh, have really made a difference and we want, this commission is really dedicated to continuing to support uh, these courageous people. So with that, I will stop talking. Thank you for joining us and please, we've got about 15 minutes 
for you to present and to take some questions and your words will help guide some of our work this afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator. And uh, folks, I welcome you if, you if you want to go ahead and bring yourself on camera as well. I have you in gallery view uh, because I want to be able to respond to you and I welcome questions. I'm gonna try to provide to you a very condensed uh, view from my perspective. And I'll tell you that the privilege of, of supporting your work is immense. I'm very grateful for what you're doing as leaders. The work you're doing in Maryland, I believe will be template work for the rest of the country. Uh, I, I can tell you, I, because I so highly regard 911 professionals, who you, as you refer to 911 specialists, being the brother of a dispatcher, I also will promise that I can never speak for them. I speak as an adopted member of what we call the 911 family. And as an adopted member, I have my role. And that role first and always has been to be a student. My expertise is in the area of psychology. I'm a master's prepared uh, clinician in the state of Michigan. My practice closed uh, in 2013 for 100% devotion to this work in 911, which is captured in the book. I am actually co-editor of that book with a 911 professional, Tracy Lorenza. Uh, and half the book is written by 911 professionals as well as medical and other experts. Uh, the reason for, for my being here today, I, I'm going to try, if I can, to provide what, you, um, what you're looking for, and that is a condensation of a couple different things. Uh, that is, first of all, what are the risks that are that are now in professionals experience? Uh, what is that risk about? What creates the kind of psychological risk and burden that they face? And then what, what do I propose that we need to do about this? If I had a wish list of just a few things that we would do, that we would prioritize, that we would standardize, what would those things be? <clears throat> so I'm going to share screen. We'll see how successful that is. Um, this will stop the other screen share. Yep, we're going to do that. And so let me just bring up the full view of this for you. Uh, so we're looking at protecting the very first responder for the sake of all. And I, I, I emphasize for the sake of all, meaning as we invest in their resilience and their call mastery, especially with calls involving mental illness and suicide, a whole different aspect that we can't get into today. In all of their work, they are helping to optimize the safety of our field responders as well as our citizens because there's a, a downflow stream that we have not fully recognized that, that includes on a time continuum, the mental health professionals like myself that would be involved in the crisis stage, greeting, meeting these people in the, in, in, the, uh, med in the medical facilities. But the very first responder is in this enormous position and they have unique stressors. I'll touch on those in just a minute, but let me just say uh, that uh, who I am is, first of all, the brother of a dispatcher. Now, that doesn't bias me scientifically. It just gave me an entry point and, and a recognition that, uh, you know, if you look back to before there were three digits, as in 911, the idea was that any chick could answer a phone. It was not recognized that they were responders, and we still have a bias, really an implicit bias in this sense regarding gender that has misrepresented uh, the enormity of the psychological demand and skill and ability that has to be present to do this job. Um, I will suggest to you that they are on scene. We, I, can, I can provide you a, a form of evidence that they are on scene, not physically, but psychologically. The diagnostic criteria of our, our manual, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, DSM-5, fifth version, which is current, recognizes that someone is exposed to traumatic, ex uh, uh, traumatic stress when there is the risk of serious injury or death to self or others. This can include through electronic media if it is in the line of duty. So this captures the reality that there should be no question in anyone's mind if we're following the science and the current recognition by our own diagnostic manuals that telecommunicators are by virtue of exposures electronically on scene that makes them responders. And therefore, we have to be sure that the, uh, we might want to have somebody mute their microphone, if they will, please. Um, we need to be sure if there is enormous demand on telecommunicators, we have to be sure that the resources meet the demand. And so that means we have to look strategically at what their stressors are, what the demands are, to be able to tailor the care that they need. This is not optional any more than a Kevlar is optional for responders heading into the line of fire. Psychologically, you must have Kevlar that will protect them just as we be, we're sure that the quality of literal Kevlar is for our field responders. 
because we have the evidence now through the work of Michelle Lilly and Dr. Allen and other studies are confirming this, that there's both PTSD and clinical depression among the special population. The rate of PTSD is about three to five times the general population at 24.6% if we're using civilian cutoff scores, which we should, because they are uh, civilians, they're not military. Uh, and so they're not, they, these numbers, 24.6% are not based on a clinical process of diagnosis as such as I would have used in the, in the, in the office and with uh, tools, but the people who com, com, uh, participated in a study, 808 dispatchers throughout the country, uh, mean uh, uh, work experience of 12.39 years, male and female all alike, uh, recognize um, that they fit the criteria for PTSD. This is an enormous finding. Uh, this is on par with our returning veterans uh, and our other responders. So when we take the definition of exposure to traumatic stress and we tie it together with what we have as the current status, the mental status of this population, we see a very strong and convincing um, truth here. And that is there's no question about whether or not they're responders and that they need our help dramatically. We're talking right now about a rate of PTSD that is in the legacy 911 environment where we have not even introduced next generation 911. And while we see the enormous benefit of next generation 911 technologies, and I would not argue with that, in the book, we identify multiple va values, including for the telecommunicator themselves of NG911 technologies, because empowerment increases confidence, which helps create a different biochemical mix, which is protective from PTSD. However, if we do not prepare our telecommunicators for legacy 911 stress, which we have not done adequately, as well as for the exposure to what, what uh, Jeremy DeMars refers to as incident related imagery through real time and recorded video, as well as photo and everything else. As we introduce these technologies, we will have predictably far more struggle with mental illness uh, and possibly threats to retention. And we already have enormous problems with that as Senator Kagan and you are well aware, uh, which is part of, I'm, I'm sure all of your work. So we also recognize that clinical depression follows closely on the heels of unresolved PTSD. Um, if somebody could identify um, and uh, mute their, their, um, their sound, that would be great, please. I don't, for my interest, I don't care for the recording for others. So we have a, a rate of 24% of clinical depression among the same population. And what we know from the research is that if you do not resolve PTSD, you are far more apt to end up with clinical depression. And folks, there's a multiplier uh, for risk of suicide, even with PTSD, even without the diagnosis of clinical depression. When you add both of those, and then the combination of possible self-medication with substances, which impairs judgment, impulse control, uh, and, and our perceptions of what is, how good life is or is not. And with survivor's guilt among our dispatchers, suffice it to say that we need to be very concerned, not only about these disorders, but about the loss of life I can document for you, um, at least anecdotally, that we do have suicides among our telecommunicators. We cannot tell you the extent to which those are directly or causally related to their, their work. But we need to, to, to affirm that the work you're doing already, that's why I'm so grateful, is so important. All of this speaks to the need for every state to adopt a minimal training standard for their people, and it must include resilience training at the very least. Funding has to follow that. Otherwise, we place our leaders in a in a position of being perceived as betraying their own because they, if, if our now professionals recognize there's a standard of care that should be delivered, but they're not delivering it, that's really not on the leader. That, that it's on all of us as stakeholders to be sure that this occurs. Um, and, and so keep in mind, these rates are also before COVID, they're BC rates. We know that not only does the general population have an increase of struggle with mental illness, we have dispatchers, as I was training yesterday in the last three days virtually, who have children in their lap while they're trying to do their work, not at the console, but in training they did. Uh, but their, their concern is just so 360. It's, it's just amazing. I'm going to just flash the list here for you, the stressors that are unique to 911. We cannot just send our dispatchers through two to four hours of training for police or anybody else. It has to be customized to their unique stressors. If it's to be preventive, and buffering of post-traumatic stress disorder and the other stress-related illnesses. Let me pause for a minute. I realize I'm speaking at teach dispatcher pace for you. Um, let me pause and invite you any comments, any questions so far, and please feel free. Going once, 
going twice. Okay. So think about this. The frequency of calls they take, you know, we could guess it's a ratio of six or 10 to one for our field responders. That means they're activating cortisol production each time they experience distress, which is ex extremely frequent. There's a half-life of cortisol of probably six to 12 hours. They have a lot of, of risk related to that if that's not mitigated by practicing resilient skills and a, and a balanced lifestyle and the kind of supports they need. Uh, there's no warning before potentially traumatic calls. Our field responders have a warning. Who, who warns them? The very first responder. So they can prepare not only tactically, strategically, but also psychologically. For the 911 professional, there is no warning before the mother is screaming about the child who's breathing, which the dispatcher knows is agonal breathing, even before the mother. There's no closure after these events. They go from one call to the next. Your, your expert 911 uh, uh, professional, Steve uh, uh, Sauter, who's on this, on this call, I uh, will testify to these things. I believe he already, already has. Um, they're psychologically unseen, but physically unable to reach it. Imagine the helplessness that has to be mitigated. And all these things can be mitigated through proper skills training to an extent. Um, I'm going to move on from here. They send their own and the, their field responders into the line of uh, danger. So they struggle with survivor's guilt. High demand from all sides, other duties as required. Little to no downtime to distress. So they have to be taught to reset psychophysiologically while they're on these calls, as you can imagine, with perhaps no break in between. Uh, they have consolidations of agencies. There are radical organizational stressors that have to be addressed. I will, uh, I'll tell you that the multitask multitasking they do, while technically it's actually rapid sequencing, it's crazy tasking because of the emotional labor that they're doing on these calls. There's a lack of first responder and public knowledge about what they do and a lack of appreciation. Uh, and so these are things that our field responders don't experience the same way. We're not in competition with our field responders. It's a larger family, but we have, all of us as stakeholders have to recognize the specific stressors they face. I can tell you that we are working on revising the, the national standard as a working group within the National Emergency Number Association to also not only address um, that all agencies should have comprehensive stress management programs or resilience plans, but they also need to evaluate how they're organizationally functioning since organizations can either mitigate or exasperate the, the stress and the health related risks, the stress related risks that dispatchers face. So in closing my part of this, before I invite questions and answers, uh, we need systematic care of telecommunicators. I'm gonna bring all three pieces of this here. If you, if you look at the model, we look at the right hand side if our demands are up into the ceiling about 10, which in any given moment, the, the level of stress for dispatch can be subjectively at a 10, we need to have resources, as I said, that manage, that, that, that match that. Core resilience training is the ground level. It's essential for all of our people. That's at least eight hours for everyone. There needs to be then support of all of them recognizing how they impact the culture as they take in so much negativity so they don't eat each other alive. That's organic peer support, that's peer support training for all, but not formally all becoming part of a team, but we also need peer support teams formally. This is, should not be cutting edge. We, we, I wish we were here 20 years ago, we're way behind, but there are leaders who are helping build peer support teams. This should be standard of care uh, and funding should be provided. So, you know, that's what I have for you. Uh, this, is, this is it, I have a bibliography with more information for you uh, and I'll just close. Uh, and thank you so much for the privilege of sharing with you. And I apologize for, for how quickly I've, I've spoken to you. I, I've, been, I've been taught to speak very quickly for telecommunicators because they are so wicked. They're so wicked smart. They're so used to having to work so quickly that they get bored if you speak at a normal rate of speech. <laughs> so there you go, folks. I would invite questions. All right, we seem to not all be able to unmute ourselves. So Jim, let me thank you again uh, for taking uh, a few minutes to join us. We want to make sure that there is an opportunity for questions or comments. I wanna start with Shar Flaherty or Heather McGaffin who, um, who jointly have been doing phenomenal work with the training and staffing, uh, staffing and training subcommittee. Then I'll ask the vice chair, Mr. Souter, if he has anything. And first, I think I probably ought to see if Tracy German, who is under the headset right this minute, if she is available and free, I would be delighted to have her either kick us off or interrupt at some point if she's not on a call. 
So with that, I throw that to any of those folks or anyone else if there are questions or comments briefly, briefly. Heather, and we need to, can okay. we? Yeah. we can, I'm, I'm trying to unmute, I'm trying to unmute people. Perfect, okay, thank so you. We, we, have, a, we have a question, Jim, um, and, and you did just touch on it. Um, but one of the things that, um, so Jim worked with our subcommittee last week. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, one of the things that we wanted to ask you, one of the recommendations that we're going to put before the commission a little bit later um, has to do with that psychological trauma training, both initially and then continuing education piece. Um, you had said four hour, between four and eight hours, and then you just said eight hours again. So I think our subcommittee just wants to understand what that actual number looks like, like where is it most effective? Is it four hours, is it eight? What, what does that look like, if you wouldn't mind? I can tell you honestly, best practice is 16 hours, but I know in the real world, that's not possible for many of our comm centers in the US. I know that as a fact, eight hours honestly should be the minimum, but when we have the choice between nothing, I'll take four hours, but if it's between nothing and four hours, the reason it requires a full eight hours is you have a culture, and I, I welcome our not only professionals there, that they are the people who should speak to this most directly. We have a culture that's been completely indoctrinated into sucking up their emotional distress, not because anybody didn't care or it was some sort of malintent, but it follows the military and the paramilitary model that there's no time for me. We're responders, we serve, we take care of those beyond us. And so what we're doing in this training is not only teaching technical skills, that's not enough. You have to help people feel permission. And not only that is the most courageous and the most encouraged thing to do in the industry to even acknowledge their emotional distress. You can teach somebody how to manage distress, but it doesn't mean they're not gonna pull the trigger or, or avoid help if they don't collectively recognize that this is an okay thing to do. Um, so there's a lot to do in eight hours. We need to teach resilient skills that are evidence-based. We can't cobble together training that's made up by people who are not subject matter experts. And we need to be sure that we talk through not only what PTSD is, we've talked enough about the problem in the country. We need to talk about what the evidence-based solutions are, which means we have to teach them not only that there's something called EMDR and cognitive reprocessing, we have to lead them to the websites, show them how they select therapists, show them what help is available. So the tasking, we need to understand is not some, we can't be simplistic. It has to be comprehensive. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Heather. Uh, other comments, questions? Tracy German, Mr. Souter, Sharp Flaherty. I'm just going to jump in and, and I'm going to be really brief, but Jim, I want to be you when I grow up. I mean, it is, you are inspirational. You provide so much information and uh, we are honored to have you here uh, guiding us in our decision-making process. And through your guidance and your leadership, hopefully our proposals uh, that come out of this commission will um, help lead our 911 specialists to a healthier environment. Amen. Thank you, Shar. Tracy German, hopefully you've been unmuted. Thank you for your service under the headset. I spent four hours with her last week and she is extraordinary. So Tracy, yes, good. We'd love to hear any comments or questions from you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Jim, I hope one day you can come to our center and give a training for us. That'd be amazing. <laughs> It'd be a privilege. And I see Steve has had, had his hand up as well and so eager to hear from Steve. My hand is up, but I don't think I, I'm unmuted unless somebody can help me do that. You're good, Steve. Yep, we hear you, Steve. We're good, we're good. Uh, first of all, Mr. Marshall, thank you for, for, for peeling the onion back on this one. Uh, over the last year, we've had studies about staffing. We've had studies about turnover. There's not a week goes by. There isn't an article somewhere in the media about the staffing crisis within the 911 center, but sadly, very few people know about it. You're looking at a guy that is a 10 percenter. And what the heck does that mean? That means I'm 10 percent of the people that enter this profession that can tough it out to the end. Because the reality is that most people drop out, they wear out, or they burn out before they even reach the thought of being retired. And all we do is throw more money and more people at a problem without addressing the root cause of the problem. So I don't know what we can do in Maryland. I don't know what we can do on this commission, but I applaud you for what you're doing. And thank you for peeling the onion again. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I just also want to mention, as I did at the, at the top of the hour, this new uh, TV show is also helping educate 
educate Americans and anyone who's watching the show about the courageous work that is being done and the stress, which is why we're kind of reaching for the stars. We will hear from the staffing and training subcommittee as to the work that they are, um, that they are recommending. And um, so thank you for that. And some of it will be reflective of your, of your guidance. So thank you. Uh, there is a question, uh, Anna, do you wanna quickly add that? And then I think we probably need to wrap up. Anna Sierra. Caroline County. Yes, what do you see the role of critical incident stress management training is in connection with your resilience training? It's an excellent question. For traditionally, even from the time I started uh, with 911, the, the complaint of dispatchers has been that they're stay on standard, not invited even to attend to briefings, even if they were the dispatcher managing the house fire, which meant multiple people perished. Um, we have to be very careful that as we embrace, I am supportive of the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation model of CISM, of critical incident stress management. I'm not, I, I would not be supportive um, in general of all CISM. It has to be based on the work, I, I believe, of Jeffrey Mitchell, the pioneer there. Having said that, there has to be fidelity in the training and the application of that model, and it has to be implemented properly in accordance with the, the uh, ICISF model. When it is, this is one of the pieces of what is essential for telecommunicators. Having said that, there's a risk when it's done wrong of, of, of complicating traumatization. So we just need to be sure that, that there's a standard for how it's done. We're trying to address that in the national standard right now. The other thing is that we have to, be, we have to recognize that while it was not necessarily Dr. Mitchell's intent with the, the CISM model that's being asked about right here, it is generally what occurs after a major event after what we call a high impact event, and it's in the short term. What we need to do is recognize, and we do have resources and a model for that that we've made available at no charge to everybody through the National Emergency Number Association. If you go to wellnesses, you can wellness initiative, you can find it, but we have to have a model that is with di dispatchers preventively. Look at, you, everyone heard what, what Steve said, um, and I'm not trying to be preachy here, but I can't overemphasize enough the role of prevention is a role of peer support. You have telecommunicators who are there with each other in real time who can notice when someone's changing in their affect and their thought and their behavior. And if we prevent by, by providing preemptive peer support, we may not end up with the tragedies that, that we're incurring in the rates of PTSD. That's the role of peer support programs. So we need to be sure that we're not old school only. And I don't mean, mean to say that SISM is old school. It's essential, but we have to build a comprehensive base Peer support programs are essential. Thank you for the question, Anna. Um, I think we need to wrap. Is there anything anyone else urgently needs to ask our phenomenal guest speaker? Okay, uh, seeing nothing um, else, I wanna thank Jim Marshall for the work that you do every day. Um, to support our 911 specialists in Maryland and around the country, probably around the world. Thank you for your book, which is educating me and many others. And thank you for making time today. That um, we bid you adieu. Um, Molly, we see you. So we're having some- Yeah, do you only see me? Is that the problem? Yes, I see you, which is a, not a problem. It's a thing, but it's not a problem. Well, it is, it is okay. a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I just want to toss back to Julia. So I want to do a time check if we could, Molly, because we have four subcommittees uh, that want to present. Yes. If Jim wants to stick around, if his schedule allows, if staffing and training wants to go first so Jim can listen and pipe in on anything, that might make sense. And then if, if Jim, you have to go at any time, you should leave. Um, and I had said that if there were questions about GIS for Julia, um, if there's an opportunity to do that, we can do that before tech and September. Does that work for everybody? And again, Jim, no obligation. If you can stick a few minutes around for a few minutes, that'd be great. Heather and Shar, are you ready to report on the work of the training and st staffing and training subcommittee? And then Molly, if you can unmute everyone, I mean, mute everyone else except the two of them. And then uh, folks can unmute when they have a question if that's possible. Okay. Mute us all, so, um, and Heather. Yeah. Okay. And then I okay. lost my, what I lost are my host rights. 
So that is the problem in that I can't control the mute at this point okay. on anybody. Um, okay. Heather, so, are you able to take control of the PowerPoint it, for your readout? I can. It looks like most folks are muting themselves. Either they have been muted or have muted themselves. So, so uh, we're good. Okay. okay, Molly, if you mute okay. yourself, I will mute myself and then we will have Heather and Shar on the screen uh, or the, cause you're still on the screen. So whoever asked me to unmute, that person, if you could ask Shar Flaherty to unmute and then Shar just hit the okay, when that box pops up, we should be good to roll. Ta da. Okay. <laughs> All right. Do you want to read? Go for it. Okay. We had a great uh, subcommittee meeting, and I think we, we've come up with some really excellent recommendations. And Jim, uh, again, your feedback would be very helpful. Um, we have spent several last year and the year before trying to come up with policies that not only bring forward training standards, but to ensure the health and safety of our 911 specialists. And as we've progressed, uh, this recommendation is very timely and very important. The recommendation is that the 911 board shall have the authority to mandate training requirements beyond what is stated in COMAR for initial training and continuing education of 911 specialists. And it gives them the opportunity to mandate training in addition to what all is already spelled out in COMAR, um, but to be able to respond to current events and current issues with you know, with the power of the board to say, you shall. And this seems to be very important as we're moving forward into the next gen environment. And as we are addressing so many challenges in the current um, event world. Heather, do you have anything you want to add? No, no, you did a good job. Thank you. Any comments? Thoughts? Concerns. All right. I think that's something. We need up. everybody the ability to un we need everybody the ability to unmute. Oh. All right. So we have a recommendation before us. Um, so Char, may I assume that you are making the motion? I am making the motion. Is there a second? Is anyone unmuted <laughs> who wants to make a second or should I, um, should I second? Because I'm the screen presenter, what I'm going through right now is I'm asking everyone to unmute. And then that I think that will solve the problem. I think I have the, the power now since I'm screen sharing. Ooh, that's a powerful position. You've there. got the power. So there is a pop-up that everyone has to agree to if they're going to yes. unmute themselves. If that gets buried, it won't work. So find out if they agree to it, please, if you can. I think the senator's cat uh, seconded the motion. Is the senator, the senator here second? So I will second. This is Aaron. I will second. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you. So my kitty wants some of my uh, cottage cheese that I just put on top of my salad. <laughs> okay. Uh, the motion has been made. What? Huh? Can we see the cat? Oh, I I will bring him back out in a little while. Well, what's the um, motion? Can you repeat the motion that? is of uh, to endorse recommendation number one. It has been moved by Char Flaherty and seconded by Aaron Smythe. Um, and I had a question, Cheryl, Susan. Yes, please, Deli right. Krebs. I just wanted to know, I mean, I, I agree with the uh, recommendation, what's behind this, but is MAKO, over, is MAKO over okay with this? Because there's a difference between counties and sometimes what their needs are, and we need to be very careful mandating specific types of training that fits all. So I didn't Thank know you. if um, it this or not. Thank you for the question. Michael Sanderson or Kevin Canale, are you on this? And can you speak to that, please? It's a good question. Nancy, we've got your face. Looking for Kevin or Michael. Hey, this is Kevin. Hey. 
Um, I think as long, you know, I think this is coming from the ENSB. Um, it's the initial training and continuing education. I think it'll be a, a public process here. So I, I think this is something that um, MAKO is okay with. Can we go back, please? Um, Kevin, what do you think in speaking to, uh, so unfunded mandates are not something that I particularly like here. Um, and so shall mandate and fund? I, we would, we would certainly appreciate that. Um, I think this should be, I was going to say an allowable expense. It, it relates directly so. to the, to the call center. So that makes sense so to too. us. Yeah. Uh, and, and I agree. Is, uh, so if, is that a friendly amendment? But I, but I, I do think that they cover training. I, I, I don't know if this would fall into that category. Mr. Yeah, this is a, looks like he wants to speak. Go ahead. Yeah. The, uh, I would argue that the board already has this authority today. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this, then, is, this is in addition to the, the minimum training standards set forth in Comar. The so board is certainly I, able to add any standards on top of that. Right. So I'd like to suggest that that would be clarifying then, but not new, um, new coverage or new costs. If we put that in there, just in case anyone has any doubt, but this is not an unfunded mandate on our 24 local jurisdictions that are already struggling financially. Um, so this would not be included in legislation that it would be <coughs> funding or funding. Delegate Jackson, do you have thoughts about that? You're on my screen. I, um, I agree, I agree. Okay, so let's just add the words, if you would, um, whoever's driving the chatter, if you can do that, uh, and we can, we can uh, make that wordsmithing. Uh, the motion is before us, can we vote please? And if we can see gallery view, if that's something that uh, that you control, no, we can each control that. I need to see everybody's votes. Thumbs up if you favor that. Cheryl, I still have a question. They just said that they're already doing this, so. No, they're saying they already cover training and this is another kind of training. So what he so this would be This would be something that would give them the authority to even do more training. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, again, do okay. they? Heather, this Char, why don't why don't you speak to that? Sure. So um, right now, the, the board does have a list of items that they can mandate training on to the, the PSAC and the 911 specialist. What we want them to be able to do is like, um, as we have the pandemic, the pandemic came up, we want the board to be able to say every or each of the 1600 911 specialists in the state of Maryland should have this pandemic training so that all residents and visitors to Maryland are getting the same um, trained specialists when they call, you know, they have the same understanding of what's happening. They have the same understanding of, of the mask regulations. If somebody calls 911 and has a question about mask regulations. So we just want to do this. So, um, when things come up, um, they're not, we're not having to wait to, for the, the board or for the subcommittees to say, oh, we need to change our regulations. We want the board to be able to say right here, we need everybody to take this training right here, right now, within the next X amount of hours. Currently, MIMS can do that to um, EMD licensed um, 911 call takers. Those folks that um, are licensed through MIMS, they can push out training, you take the training and that's how your licensure stays up to date. So we're just, we wanna give that authority, uh, just like the, the police training commission would give to police officers, just like uh, fire departments give to their firefighters, just kind of to set that playing field more level for that public safety arena. Okay, I just wanna make sure I can defend this when it becomes a bill and I have to say, why do we need this bill? And I need to be able to understand why. <laughs> so. Okay, so with that, the motion's on the table. Anna, briefly. Yeah, I, I guess I am confused as to how this would work. Is this an authority we're giving the executive director of the board? Because if not, then the board would still have to meet and vote, which means potentially that delay would still exist. Heather, would you put the wording of the recommendation back up on the screen, please, so we can all see that? Sure, we'll just, we'll lose our gallery view. I just know it. Okay. We want next recommendation number one. Do you want to read that again for anybody who can't read it? Sure. The 911 board shall have the authority to mandate training requirements beyond what is stated in COMAR for initial training and continuing education of 911 specialists. And we reach later, we go into um, resiliency training that Mr. Marshall talked about. So I think, again, to echo what 
what Scott Rippers already said, the board already has the ability, the, the authority to do this is my understanding. So is my understanding incorrect? No, that's Andrew correct. Myers, uh, uh, I would, I would concur with your, your comment, Mr. Roper's comments. I think, I mean, there's nothing that prevents the board from enunciating, uh, requirements that would apply to the counties today. Okay. Okay, so Shar, Heather, what is your what is your pleasure? There is a motion on the table right now. Mr. Stan. Is is there an opportunity to mandate Steve, if you can mute before you walk away for your dog. Yes, go ahead. Uh-huh. Is there an opportunity to mandate right now? something that would be um, outside of Comar to say we need to have the eight hours of um, psychological training, uh, stress relief, um, those type of things, to mandate it for everybody to have the same level of training? Or is, is it, and to fund, as a a standard training process, or is it something that each individual jurisdiction would have to come to for funding and for enforcement training? I think that what we're trying to accomplish is removing the individualized um, option. So, so the board can require anything. Um, the board's only um, stick in this is if a county isn't in compliance, the board by a vote of the majority members present of public meeting with all funds. Uh, same with any other board standard. So the, the board has this today. And theoretically, to go to the funding discussion, um, if the board determined that a specific, a specific actual class, say we wanted everybody to go through that eight hour resiliency training, um, and that specific training, like we do require ETC, EMD, EFD, that kind of stuff. Um, either it could be a county project on behalf of the state or the state could move forward and procure that training and offer it to everybody on behalf of the state. Those are the two current mechanisms to get that done so that it wouldn't have to be an individual project to get individual funding that's mandated by the board. It's a pleasure, folks. So, I just, I just want to try to be clear. If, if, if we already have the authority to do what we're, we're asking, then why are we doing what we're asking? All right, Heather. Yeah, I, I, I wrap this up. We have a lot more work to do. Yeah. So, I, we'll, we'll take this one back. Then, I guess, Shara, that's up to okay. you. Okay. Let's move yeah. this to the parking lot. See if that needs to be changed. Can we go to recommendation number two? So, the, so we'll. The maker of the motion withdraw the motion, so it is officially not before us anymore. It is withdrawn. Thank you, Shar. Step number two, please. Heather and Char. <laughs> okay, so number two, the 911 board shall mandate all 911 specialists complete eight hours of evidence and science-based training and psychological resilience during their initial training period and each year of their employment. Um, that comes from the, the presentation that we, we just saw. And again, that would be mandate and pay for. And again, while we think that that's clear, adding that clarity. Um, so I will, I, is there a motion? And then I will have a friendly amendment to just make clear that it would be paying for it as well. Shar, are you making that motion for recommendation number two? I am making that motion for recommendation number two. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Jim, sorry, you don't have a vote right now. <laughs> Quite all right. Mr. Vice Chair, you want to second that motion? So with a comment too, although the board will be funding the training, the reality is that in the way that we traditionally have provided training, a lot of people would have to be backfilled at their position, um, which has an inherent cost to it. So I, I, would, I would comment that whatever training is done should be done in the context of virtual training if possible, something that would minimize the personnel cost for somebody traditionally going to a, a, a course. Jim, do you have anything you want to say about that? And do we want to put that in writing or shall it be the sense of any thoughts by the subcommittee or by Mr. Marshall? 
Yes, uh, I, I, I see Steve's, Steve's point absolutely. In the state of Michigan, they provide funding also for backfilling. So they have monies that are allocated to include the cost of backfilling for those the, for the supported positions taken out uh, and, and in the training. Uh, realistically speaking too, I, I think there's some flexibility. Um, while it would be ideal to have it every year, uh, I, I think in the state of Michigan, I'm trying to remember how that works, but um, they have X number of hours per category and you could consult that. I think it's fabulous that we have it right now. I think to Steve's point, um, if, if the funding will not be allowed also for backfilling, uh, then there would have to be the option to deliver the training um, um, virtually to decrease that cost. That makes sense. So I'm going to suggest that we trust the 911 board on the details of this. It's certainly the intent of the commission, and we would want to clarify that we expect our 911 specialist to take this training. But um, devil's in the details, I know. But who pays for this, that, and the other? I think um, personally, I'm okay with trusting the 911 board, staff and board. So um, I, I I just like to add that statutorily, the the trust fund can't. Um, fund salary and benefits for county employees. Absolutely, we know that. Uh, we'll Thank back you, Mr. Back. Okay. Um, so that, any other so comments means, or questions? So that means this would be an unfunded mandate? No, that's specifically not what we're talking about. Kevin, do you want to speak to that? <laughs> no, that that is that is true, Senator, because the board is statutorily prevented from from providing that funding for the back bill. They cannot pay for backfill, they can't pay for overtime, they can't pay for the holes created by this training for, at the local level. But there is a requirement to have in-service training and that is a mandate and that does not include backfilling. So all we're doing is enhancing that an existing requirement. And um, so it is for the good of the order and um, the it would be, it could be, we could put in here as part of the in-service training. So as, Heather, as, it looks like Heather training. wants to add something. Ed. <laughs> no, Ross raised his hand, and so I think I'm muting him. Thank Ross. you, Heather. Um, so wh while I fully support the need for this, um, I do have a couple of concerns <laughs> about the accessibility for this type of training, um, the costs associated with it. And while, you know, it's great that we could potentially uh, recover the cost of backfilling the position, the reality is we don't have the people to backfill those positions. So there is definitely some, um, some significant impacts in my book as a PSAP manager um, to the requirement that there is eight hours of training and the accessibility of that training. Um, you combine that with the already required continuing education requirements placed upon us maintaining our patients. And um, Ross, no, you're breaking up a bunch. Have to sit on oh, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, pretty I soon can... we're gonna have uh, people that are um, you know, attending so much training, they're hardly available for under the headset. So let's just be cautious with what we mandate in the time requirement. Kevin Canale, look like you wanted to speak. I mean, I, I think I think we share Ross's concerns. Um, the last thing we want to do is is create more of a problem in terms of staffing. We all know that recruitment and retention is a challenge, and so you know, agree with the concept here. But I I have heard concerns today. Um, from some of our folks who are worried that they just don't have the personnel to backfill for this training and they're worried that this would lead to, you know, empty seats. And that's, again, I think the last thing anybody wants. Okay, Aaron has something to add? Um, I, and I think that's actually why we should go ahead and mandate it because I think we would be able to retain and attract people more if they know they, uh, that this is part of um, the mandated training and that they will get that training and will we'll be able to retain people longer. There'll be less of an issue backfilling. So that's why, and I don't know if there was a second, but I will second. Thank yeah. you, Aaron. Um, so I see Anna wants to speak. I'd like to vote. How many recommendations does the subcommittee have, Heather, please? We have five. Five, oh. you guys, it's 151. We have a lot of work to do. Um, so my suggestion, ask. yeah, Anna, briefly. And I then, just wanted to ask for an amendment to this so that maybe we could get to the 
get a voting to it. So my recommendation would be to take out after the each year of their employment. So we can mandate it for the initial training period, which won't be a huge impact to PSAP directors because we're mm -hmm. it's just adding eight hours to their initial training before they're actually under the headset. We're not pulling anybody out of the center to do it. And then it would be up to the PSAPs to provide that continuing education in a format that meets our needs as a staffing agency. Okay, so is that a formal motion? It's a formal amendment request. Um, uh, right, I understand. Yeah. Is there a yeah. second to that um, proposed amendment to put a period after period? Uh, second. Period. So I hear Kelly Krebs or Kelly Clay Stamp. Okay, so I'm going to speak against that motion. Um, I'm only one voice, but I'm going to suggest that the whole point of one of our top missions this year, in my opinion, uh, was to support our 911 specialists. And eight hours and you're done does not provide ongoing support. And people who are under the headset, as Tracy has been for years and years and years, 12 years plus, um, 12 years ago, things were a lot different. I think the support and the opportunity to create a culture of support um, and conversation is vitally needed. Um, and that's part of what Jim Marshall was telling us. So I'm gonna vote against the am uh, uh, proposed amendment. So <clears throat> does anyone else wanna speak uh, for or against it or should we vote? Senator, I'm gonna just speak. Whoa, 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 whoa. hold on. Mr. Myers, then Deli Krebs and Jim Marshall, if you wanna pop in super briefly, but go ahead. Uh, Senator, to the point you just made, uh, one of my concerns is that, you know, hard coding standards of this nature, I, I, I find a little bit troubling because we find ourselves in an evolving uh, industry. And I, I think that the board should have the flexibility to, with input from the counties and, and other partners in this endeavor, to be able to define on a, a moving basis as to what those training requirements should be. So I just have a, a general concern about hard, hard coding these types of standards. Thank you. So is there, before I go to Delegate Krebs, is there a middle ground here, you know, cutting the baby in half of eight hours of resilience training during initial training and then four, year, four hours in a whole year out of 2,080 in a normal, you know, 2,000 hours? Uh, four hours, is that is that a middle ground that folks would find acceptable as a concept? Just I, 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 was, I agree with what Anthony said. We could, we could strongly encourage ongoing, ongoing training. And it's, it's the amount, it's, it's picking a number, tracking that number and being stuck to it, that it, it concerns me. I, I think this is very, very important. And I, I really believe that our PSAPs believe that it's important as well. So if we could write in there the initial training and then ongoing without de you know, determining it's four hours, it's eight hours. It could, when you pick a number four, hey, maybe they really need eight. And you're, you're basically saying four and it gives a new floor. So I'd, okay. I don't, I'd rather see the board make the decision and, and local PSAPs as to what their needs are, but recommend, you know, eight hours period and then continuing. And, and it's up to the, the board or the PSAPs to just, we're putting this in state law. I mean, that's what we're asking to be done. Okay, so Delia Krebs is trying another way of cutting the baby here, which is uh, eight hours when you first come on and then some continued uh, training in resilience, but not with a specific number. Delia Krebs, then Kevin Canale, and then Jim Marshall has unmuted if you wanna add anything. And then I think we've got to vote and move forward. Delia Jackson. Yes, um... So I, I know uh, uh, from the law enforcement community, um, the Training and Standards Commission uh, requires a minimum of 18 hours, but uh, you will be hard pressed to find any agency that goes below 50 hours uh, of training throughout the year. Um, the caveat to that is uh, sometimes there are not annually, sometimes they are uh, from an assessment perspective on when those trainings are needed. Um, whether it's um, every other year or, or as necessary. Uh, with the Public Safety Work Group, Police Accountability and Reform Work Group, uh, we are implementing uh, mental health um, trainings as well. Uh, and um, in, in what we're looking at now, the recommendations are during the initial training and then um, periodically throughout the career where it is left to the locales to determine when that's necessary. So 
that's what the, the law enforcement side is doing. Um, just wanted to give you that note. Thank you, Kevin. And then Jim Marshall, if Kevin's. Yeah, I, I think I, I just, I, again, I, I do echo the, the concerns just about um, the amount of training and what it would mean for some of our, our 911 centers and the availability of staff to backfill. I think, I, I don't think we can overlook those concerns. I mean, I'm hearing them directly and I feel like I have to, to keep pushing that, that concern because again, if this is not feasible or possible in, in some of our centers, um, I have to raise the flag and, and raise that concern. I, I do think there's a way um, to split the baby here. I don't, I think this is super important important. I agree. I just, you know, from an operational perspective, I am concerned of what it would mean because I'm hearing directly from the folks on the ground, the ones who are running the 911 call center. So I feel like I just need to run that up the flagpole again and hope that we can find a way to, to make sure we accomplish what you're seeking to accomplish here, but also not put our centers in peril. Yeah. And I, Jim, would, yeah, thank you. Thank you for recognizing me, Senator. Uh, I, I think we do need to recognize what Kevin is saying when we have these subject matter experts of different sorts. So I am of one sort, but our, our PSAP directors who are dedicated to the well-being of their people also have this enormous challenge. We can have backlash. So if you don't have the backfilling and you've got people off the floor and they're overwhelmed now even more, and then there's resentment even of the training, that can be counterproductive. And so uh, I, I, I think this, the, the, the proposal here is phenomenal. The challenge is how do you work with the different funding sources? Because in the state of Michigan, the mandate is directly tied to funding the backfill as well. And right now you have apparently legislation that disallows uh, the, the, the funding for backfill. And so it seems like there's some work that has to be done here with funding so that the concerns like Kevin has are, are balancing the giving of this of the resilience training. I'm sorry if I'm complicating things, but you know. Okay, um, Tracy German, tell us your thoughts since you live this every day. Sure, and I'm actually sitting here with um, sure. another 911 list and we're kind of laughing about the backfill thing because I'd say at least 75% of the training that we do, we're doing while we're actively taking calls, in between calls, in between answering the radio. And unfortunately, it's not the most effective kind of training, but if you get that four hours a year, it's probably not going to be a class in psychological resilience. It's probably gonna be a printout or a PowerPoint. And it's something that we're doing while we're actively working. So keeping that in mind, there's not gonna be so much of that backfill issue, just realistically. Thank you, Tracy. Is there an opportunity for us again to split the baby as, as Senator Kagan wisely said, <laughs> is to say, to require the eight hours of initial training period and to require res psychological resilience training periodically at the recommendation of the board um, so that we can understand how important this is as we're as we're starting however you know each year that goes by the 911 specialists are suffering from uh, cumulative traumatic experiences and they need to be reminded of how to make sure that they can reset and learn how to empty the bucket and all of those other things that um, unless it's reinforced is, is going to be one of those things where they hear wah, wah, wah. It's a, it's a policy and we can ignore it and it's going to go away because nobody's going to enforce it. So I, I think if we're going to continue to push for the uh, workers comp aspect and everything else like that, we need to say that we care enough to provide the training as we're moving forward to reduce the impact of the workers comp. So if there is a way of requiring the initial start out and then to say that um, additional training will be required as part of the in-service training, which is already uh, a mandate. So and Char, I'd like to, I, I want to recap and I'd like anybody's thoughts, Molly or the vice chairman or whoever on how we do this. Um, I want to be a little flex. We're not totally Robert's rules here. It's a small enough group, but we have three things that have been proposed. 
One, I guess four things. One is precisely this language that's on the screen right now, which is eight hours for initial and eight hours per year um, of employment. That's option one. Option two would be uh, uh, putting a period after the word period. So it would be eight hours during initial training period saying nothing about the future. That's option two. That's what's before us right now. Then there are two cut the baby in half. Um, one would be uh, eight hours during initial training and then four hours for each year during employment um, every year. And that would be mandating that. And the other, the last option would be mandating eight hours during initial training and then we really, really hope you're gonna do it, but we're not gonna tell you how much and we're gonna leave it to the PSAPs or the board. So those are four totally different concepts. Um, Heather, do you have thoughts on how, or it looks like Mr. Souter might wanna speak. Heather, from a procedural perspective, those are, how do you wanna do this? Can we, can we, I, I've, I've written down everybody's thoughts. Can we maybe take this back and, and flush it out a little bit more um, so that everyone Okay. Their thoughts can. Okay. Shar, Sean, everybody's saying that that might be a good idea. Okay. I think it's a great idea. All right. Let's move on to recommendation number before three. We do, so, before we do, I, I like please. to add we should not lose sight of the fact that within the 911 board, there's a training subcommittee that is dealing with how to implement the training that was required, excuse me, that was required in the last, <laughs> that was required in, in the previous bills. So somehow what we're talking about today has to be melded with that. Now that subcommittee is being supported by Josh Jack. I don't know whether Josh Jack wants to comment on that now, but I think I whatever we may approve now has to be done in the context of how is it going to meld all together. Thank we you, Mr. Vice Chair. So Heather, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to cut this. If we're not gonna take action on it, I'm gonna suggest that it's not the best use of our time to have further conversation. If you have thoughts, please email them to me, to Heather, to Char, we, we, you guys have everybody's addresses, um, email addresses. I think there were some very uh, thoughtful and uh, persuasive comments that were made um, by the delegates, by Aaron, by Tracy, by, um, by a lot of people, so by Jim. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's move forward if we could. Number three, Heather and Number three. Add audible psychological traumatization as a recognized trauma risk to 911 specialist under Maryland workers' compensation law. So can we have a motion on this? Shall I'll move. Yes, okay. I move that uh, this is uh, a recommendation. Okay, is there a second on this? A second. Okay, Aaron seconds it. Now, conversation, debate. If not, we can move to a vote. I have, I have one can question. Somebody just you... take a, okay, Clay, hold seconds. on, sorry. Clay, stand first. Can somebody just take like 30 seconds and just talk a little bit about this so we have a better understanding? Thank you. Um, Heather, do you want to talk? Yeah. So um, recently, Colorado added audible psychological traumatization to their list of risks for their workers' compensation law. Um, our subcommittee looked at that documentation. Um, right now, if someone is exposed to um, recurring trauma um, from what they're hearing on 911 calls, it is not a workers' compensation covered injury or, um, or risk. So, Jim worked with us last week to, to recognize that just because you're exposed to trauma doesn't mean that you're traumatized. Um, and so there would be some, some guardrails on this, right? Not every person who took something that was traumatic or, or was affected by things, which is why the training becomes important as Sharp was mentioning. Um, but this is so that if those folks physically can no longer take 911 calls because of the trauma that they've been exposed to and experienced, while being a 911 specialist, that would be something that the workers' compensation um, board could take into account. It would be a, a injury that is recognized. Okay, helpful, Mr. Stamp. Anyone else uh, yeah. comments? Can I just ask, I assume that that term is absolutely 100% valid medically 
that no one would challenge that term. I know nothing at all about it, but I'm assuming that is a fully accepted medical term. I think we, it was from Colorado. Does, can anyone speak to that, Heather or Sharp? It's the verbiage that is exactly what's in Colorado law. And um, I don't know if Jim is still on the line, but he did, he did review this with us, Sean. So we, we felt very confident in putting this before the um, Steve here uh, and Heather too. Um, it seemed like a mouthful and I'm not quite sure that it resonates well within uh, the Maryland community. Uh, so although I'm not opposed at all to the concept, but I think that better verbiage that's more succinct to the point and communicates more clearly what this is all about in the context of 911 emergency and stress would be helpful. This is uh, Anthony Myers. Uh, this this change would be outside of the Maryland 911 statute. I'm just curious whether anyone's consulted with the hosting agency. Hosting agency, DPSCS? No, Maryland Compensation, uh, Workers' Comp. Workers' Comp, whomever, whomever oversees the Workers' Comp. So there are, there are questions about the details of this. This is an important uh, policy indicator. My suggestion would be, my recommendation would be, there is a motion on the floor that we, if we approve this, and it can be, it's okay with me if we do a tentative approval, then seek to get uh, to get more data, see if we can get a fiscal estimate, explore some other stuff. But I think I don't want to waste a whole lot of my time or mission criticals or anyone else's if this um, if this may not move forward. So and I, I'm sure I'd like to mention that what what I'd like to sorry Sue two sets. What I'd like today, if it's the will of the commission, is to get like a sense of the commission uh, a, a tentative vote. This will not be the formal vote in the. Um, in the report, but then we can get some more. Delegate Krebs, go ahead. Yeah, it'd be nice to know if this is in, in workman's comp law for any other um, lines of business, because I mean, obviously in the police agencies, fire agencies, they have the, the same type of uh, audible physiological traumatization could be. So it'd be nice to know if this is a new, is, some, is a new territory or is it something we're just adding 911 operators to something that's already in statute for another line of business? Because there's a lots of line of businesses. So. It's going to be uncharted territory if we're just adding this new type of um, traumatization. But it, if we're adding it to another list of people, it might be a little easier. So again, Karen Shar, do you have that data, or can you speak to that? Or this this would be new, Delegate Krebs. This is not currently something that I could find in workers' compensation laws in Maryland. Because there's other first responders and other kinds of people that might uh, have these same issues, and the question is. You know how do how do we address it for them as well? That so right kind of question is going to come. Other first responders are covered under post traumatic stress syndrome, and that was actually going to be my question: is why we were specifying audible psychological trauma traumatization rather than simply recognizing that audible can be a part of post traumatic syndrome stress syndrome and covering it under the same umbrella that already covers EMS, fire, and law enforcement. And actually, that's what I thought we were doing with this, yeah. And I'm just asking you the questions that we're going to be asked when we get to the table and have to defend the bill, and we're going yes. to be asked questions. <laughs> so, okay, so you. here's what I'd like to do. Jim, go ahead, and then I, I have a proposal. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, does, does Maryland's workers' compensation law already address or recognize psychological traumatization as a trauma, as a risk to 911 specialists? No. No, no, it doesn't. So let me just suggest this. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know that there's any psychological within the, within the science of psychology, a, a, a recognition of, in, in, in the literature about audible psychological traumatization. I jumped on supportively anything you're doing to recognize that, but I'm not sure the term audible is necessary. I think the most important thing is that psychological traumatization itself is recognized as a risk for telecommunicators, for now and specialists. And the reason that, that might be savvy to drop the word audible is because we with NG911 are gonna be having visual traumatization too. And then do we have to have another one for visual? No, why not just make it? Psychological traumatization is a recognized risk to 911 specialists. I have to tell you, Jim, I have wondered that every time I read this uh, recommendation. So thank you for voicing what I've kind of been musing about. Here's what I'd like to suggest. Hold on, Clay. I'm gonna to try to suggest 
I think there are a lot of questions. I think there are valid questions. I think we need more information. What I'd like to find out now is the sense of the commission. As a concept, do you support the concept of workers' comp for our 911 specialists or not? If you do, you're not signing your life away. If you support the concept, we still need to get a lot more information. We need to clarify language. We need to get a fiscal impact. We have to then answer a bunch of questions on that. So the question right now is, this is not for recommendation number three. This is a separate general concept. Do you support the concept of our 911 specialists being included under our workers' comp law? And with that, I'd like the voting, thumbs up, thumbs down. And Tracy and anyone whose face is not on, I need you to be audible if you would. I see thumbs up. I see a lot of thumbs, thumbs up here. Thumbs up from Tracy. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, are you abstaining? Probably or okay. And then Julia Fisher is away from her. Uh, okay. Any uh, all those opposed? Thumbs down. I see no thumbs down. And then anyone who wants to abstain, speak now. Julia, you were not recorded as having voted. If you want to give a quick thumbs up, thumbs down on the concept of workers' comp, thumbs up. Thank you. Okay. All right. Senator, I don't know enough about it. So I'll... more information. I, Senator, may I make one other comment just as we move forward? There is um, there is case law here in Maryland, so I think that should be one of the things we look at as well. This has been in the courts when it comes to PTSD and how the courts have um, have adjudicated those issues. So. I do think it would make sense to look there too and make sure that whatever we're drafting is not is not in conflict with with what the Maryland courts have said too. So just to, just to make sure. Well, I mean, can I can I just comment on that? I mean, I, I think our point is historically, if the courts say their reading of workers' comp doesn't include audible trauma or, or you know traumatization, that we do want to be in conflict. We sure. actually want to change it. So that absolutely. I, I like I said. I, I just think that. We need to make sure if, if that's what we want that mm -hmm. you beef it up and make sure that it holds and the attorney general's office will have to be part of this conversation yeah. because I agree. yeah it will ultimately be the state to get sued so they're going to have to bless anything we come up with and that's why i wave the flag about that term i think we need to only put in a term that's recognized both medically and legally okay thank you sean um, Heather, you're capturing all of this. I would like to invite anyone who either is not on any subcommittee or who's willing to be on a second subcommittee or who would like to change subcommittees because they have questions, thoughts, or opinions about workers' comp or any of these issues this subcommittee is working on. Um, some other groups are a little bit wrapping up their work or are less controversial. I think we, um, I think we need to try to get some more folks in this conversation before we come to the full commission. So Heather, do you feel like you have what you need? We have a long list of follow-up on recommendations. We have a long list to follow up on. And yes, and and you know, honestly, um, Char, for our fourth and fifth recommendation, Char and I just need to have a sidebar real quick. I, I think maybe in the interest of time that those are probably gonna have to go back for some more fleshing out too. And Tracy, if you agree, because our subcommittee today, the only commission members on the subcommittee that were it were Shar and Tracy. So okay. you might need some help for four. Okay. Four. All right. Well, let's I make agree. sure that you get that help then. And uh, so I think then we should go to another subcommittee. Jim Marshall, thank you for sticking around. Thank you for your guidance. We may be circling back to you um, as we continue our efforts to support our 911 specialists. I have privilege, I applaud you guys. This is thick stuff, keep with it. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Be safe, take care. All right, so Heather and Shar, thank you. These are hard issues. I have said multiple times that I think the staffing and training subcommittee is going to be the ones that are making the biggest impact this year. I think you guys, this is your year to shine. I'd like a motion please that Heather McGaffin is not allowed to leave mission critical. <laughs> and our subcommittee until after we get all this figured out. <laughs> I second that. I second. Yeah, third. third, fourth. Okay, sorry, Heather. I'll call <laughs> for you. <laughs> all right, um, moving on. Uh, do we have Molly here? Who wants to go next? You want to do uh, the joint subcommittees, run through that? Molly, or you want to do transport, uh, cyber and technology and cyber, or you want to do the joint? I'm happy to do either one. Well, uh, I think, can you all hear me? Am yep. I still here? Yep. Uh, I guess, Josh, how many do tech and cyber have 
at this point based on your conversations? We have six. God. You have six are you that are ready to go? 16. <laughs> six as opposed to eight, correct. Okay, let's see if you guys can plow through these. I am hoping that some of these are such obvious consensus that we can move forward quickly. I'm gonna suggest <clears throat> the time that if there are tons of questions um, that we might need to, to move on because tech and uh, over, oversight and accountability and finance and structure also have uh, important work to report on. So if we can make that larger, that'd be great. And let's start with slide number one. Uh, and so just to, Sam, just to prep, yes. So yeah, good morning or afternoon. So just to preface, I am perfectly fine with um, you know, uh, giving the thumbs up to go forward and just uh, tweak some of these wordings if people are okay with the idea. Um, so recommendation number one um, relates to non-service initialized phones, primarily being used for domestic violence programs. Uh, so the wording is any programs that provide mobile devices to domestic violence victims ensure that they provide phones with full service access to voice and data needs of the individual being given a device. So the background on that basically is just um, plain and simple. If you want to provide someone as an organization a phone to connect to 911, uh, we are suggesting that you give them a device that is not a NFI phone so that they can use the full benefits of 911 and next-gen technology. So two things, Randy, I wanna flag for you that the language that you read is not precisely the current recommendation draft okay. language. Sorry, I um, That's okay. my notes. That's case. quite all right. Second, this would probably not be in legislation. This is, um, this is a public safety recommendation based on the expertise of those here. Is there a motion? I'm going to assume the chair is generally making the motion. Randy, will you make a motion to on recommendation? I make a motion to proceed with this recommendation. Okay. Is there a second, please? Second, Souter. Souter, thank you. All those, let's do thumbs up, thumbs down. I don't think this one's super complicated. I see a lot of thumbs up. Are there any thumbs down on this one? I see none. Recommendation number one is approved. Recommendation number two, Randy, go ahead. I'm going to wait. Okay, so recommendation number two again does, deals with NSI phones. Urge the Federal Communications Commission (FCC) to revisit efforts to address use of non-service initialized NSI phones and explore alternatives when supporting wireless carriers serving resource-challenged populations. This is more or less just a um, again a recommendation that the commission. Um, ask the FCC to revisit their efforts. I know this has been brought up in the past with the FCC. I know um, ASCO and Nina all had comments on it. Um, we're just asking basically that this does not um, so this fade would, off in the background. This To clarify, this would either be a letter on behalf of the commission to the FCC, Deli Krebs, Delegate Jackson, we can talk about this, or it can be uncodified language calling on, I didn't like the idea of a separate Joint resolution, which I think just takes right. time and money and all that. So moved. Okay, Sean Looney moves. Randy, you're going to second it. Second. Okay. Uh, can we get thumbs? Thumbs up. Any thumbs down? I see none. Moving on. Recommendation number three. Uh, three. We're actually going to table and move to four. Okay. Number four. Uh, four is GIS data standardization. EZNet providers shall apply the I3 standardized data to the National Emergency Number, I, sorry, to the National Emergency Number Association standards as provided by the state. Um, just a little bit of quick history on this. Nina has come up with I3 GIS standards that EZNet providers are to use. However, we are finding that EZNet providers do not want to use those standards. Um, don't quite understand that myself. If they came up with a standard, why didn't you want to use it? And this is basically saying, uh, again, that you will comply with these standards that Nina has set forth. Okay, is there a motion, Randy? I make a motion that we okay. adopt this recommendation. Second, Julia. <clears throat> Julia, I didn't hear you. Were you second? Yes, yeah, second, Julia is here. Okay, thumbs please. This discussion. Uh, um, yeah, can, we, can we have discussion on this? Please, please go ahead. 
Go ahead, Chairman Myers. Yes, I would just launch my, my, my uh, general concern with codifying standards and to, if that is the recommendation to codify this in legislation. I mean, the I-3 standard will eventually change. That was and that makes you comply with that standard. Sorry, uh, that was also going to be my question. Is the intent for this to become legislation and therefore codified, or is this simply a recommendation to be included in the commission report? I'll be honest with you. I'm not, I'm new to this, so I'm not sure of the differences. I just don't understand why. I mean, whatever it takes to make an ESINET provider operating in the state of Maryland to use a standard that was set forth by a national, by NINA. Um, I don't know if that needs to be legislation or a recommendation, but we can't have standards and not hold ourselves to them, in my opinion. If, if I can clarify, mm -hmm. it, if I may clarify, so it's, it's our understanding and, and Josh or whomever else, please correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it's my understanding that DesiNet providers are not suggesting they won't use the standard. They're asking the state to submit data in a format different than the standard and that they will then take our data and ensure that it complies with the standard. What our position is, is that because we are a multi net state environment, is that we are working collectively to validate against the I3 standard and would like to then provide that validated result to the individual ESINET providers rather than providing it to them in a format where there is a translation required and then a second translation required to get it back into the standard. By doing so, you potentially add in error. I was telling the group not to get too technical, but in particular, they're talking about um, the uh, coordinate systems. They're requesting in a different coordinate system. Coordinate systems are very precise and highly technical. And when you start using systems to translate from one coordinate system to another, you inherently add error. We would like to prepare the data in the standard and they accept it in that format. Julia, you support the motion. I do. Okay. Um, can we move forward with the vote? I see Clay Stamp nodding his head. Um, seeing no other questions, can we go with thumbs? Is, is the motion to, to put this in legislation or is the motion to put this in the report? I'm still not clear about that. Uh, well, it's certainly to approve this uh, this statement. Um, I think I'd have to defer to Josh and Randy as to what the intent is, but that can also be part of the conversation. Every version of the report will be discussed, modified, and, and language clarified before. I would, I would say the motion is to move forward, trying to figure out where to put this, and then we will vote on where to put it. So the motion is to to approve approve this sentence and then the this, right this draft okay i guess thank you for the clarification okay if we can thumbs please thumbs up if you're okay tracy can you please we need to all right yep, thumbs up thumbs up from tracy any thumbs down do we have thumbs down i see none moving forward and we will clarify Okay, Anthony Myers wants to be on the record against that. That's a thumbs down. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we know enough about what we're doing here. Okay, so that's so we're going to have to get more information on this, on the specifics of this, and where it should go, and what that looks like. Right. Let's but you, forward. everyone, wants us to move forward with doing that, correct? I think the sentiment is there. The question is, devils in the details is my is what I feel like I've discerned. Okay. Number five. Five, we have table to move to six. Uh, GIS data, the Department of Information Technology in coordination with the jurisdiction shall develop and distribute a statewide sustainable standardized schema for each value added GIS data set identified by the Emergency Communication Committee, ECC, as beneficial to improving emergency incident location. I guess, Josh, if you wanna 
Um, yeah, if you can translate, I mean, words like schema is, uh, is hard for some of us. So if we can put that in plain English as to what this means. Sure, I, I can, or Julia, if you want to, I will give you first dibs. Thank you. Um, this um, goes specifically to the briefing that I was talking about regarding uh, this summer's incident at the Potomac River. So the GIS community is talking about moving forward uh, along with the I-3 NINA standard recommendations that there will be a state specific. Uh, we would like to also work, we will work with NINA to see if this will go broader than just state, but for now, a state-specific schema that will accommodate and standardize. Um, so that's a data format uh, with the fields that will match um, across the entire state with additional information for those non-traditional locations. So each county, each PSAP will be capturing and maintaining that information in a standard manner. Um, and then once we agree upon that, a future state would then be to uh, address that with the technology vendors. This in particular is with the CAD vendors. So they are engaged in conversation in consuming that additional data uh, and that additional standard to improve location accuracy. So ultimately that is the goal. Um, so the GIS community, we will get all of our ducks in a row first. Uh, and then we will approach the vendor community to ensure that they are uh, working in conjunction with us toward that end. Okay, Josh or Randy, anything you would add? Are we good? Are we ready to vote? Are there additional questions? I just, no, I have- Let's go to thumb. Oh, almost. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, it's just no basic question. Same question as yeah. last time. Is the intent to have this codified in statute or Comar, or is this just a recommendation that do it could taking on without codification. So we've had a number of conversations regarding activities that are going on within the GIS community. Traditionally, we have done so in good faith. We are moving forward now because we realize the vitality and the importance of these activities. At the very least, we're asking for a recommendation be endorsed mm -hmm. by the uh, commission within the annual report um, and we can definitely start there. If that uh, proves to be successful, we may need to revisit this. If we are not seeing uh, people that are participating and you know coming on board um, with the recommendation, um, with the weight of the recommendation, we may need to move forward with perhaps a policy or legislation. So I believe at this time that we are not going you know straight to the heart of uh, codification, as you mentioned. Leah? I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to suggest that this would be the same situation as the prior recommendation that we approved, which is this is do you support this concept? Do you support these works? And then we will definitely circle back. Uh, as you know, I always share you'll see draft reports. We'll be voting on draft reports. We're going through this again when there's legislation that's drafted. Everybody gets a copy of that. This isn't the only bite at the apple. So, and Cheryl, I, I thank, thank Anna for the question. That's a good question on each one of these recommendations because mm -hmm. in theory, I agree with all these things, but I also think as Anthony mentioned a couple of recommendations ago, you know, when you codify these things, it doesn't allow for, for, for change. So each recommendation would be nice to know whether we want to codify it or we just want to end the report. Thank you, Dolly Krebs. Okay, with that, can we, are we ready for thumbs? Okay, normally to those who are watching, if anyone's watching this and finding it fascinating, uh, normally we have red, yellow, and green uh, cards that we hold up when we're all in the same room, but this is uh, the quicker version than doing a roll call. So Anna Sierra was ready with three colors of voting cards, but the rest of us were not. Scott Brillman, I'll need to get a face or a vocal. Sean Looney, same thing. Okay, thumbs please, thumbs up. Thumbs for Tracy. Thumbs for Tracy, thank you, thumbs up. And any thumbs down? I see none, thank you. Uh, is that the end of tech and cyber? No, oh, we have more. We have more, all right. Two more, Randy, two number more. Seven, Josh, Randy. Yeah. So uh, number seven, remote call taking capabilities. This is just a recommendation to be included in the report. Uh, basically having a next gen 911 commission um, 
expand or recommend to expand broadband infrastructure in underserved rural areas to benefit public safety, remote emergency call taking and dispatching capabilities. So as everyone knows, uh, there's many areas in Maryland that don't have broadband. Um, we just want um, our voice on the various committees in the state working on that um, to know that we're in support. So I just want to add on this one because this is really important and I thank the subcommittee for taking it on. Thank you, Randy, for your leadership and Ross Coates. Um, Harford County has really been leading the way, but COVID has, has um, amplified the need to be able to do remote uh, call taking and dispatching. And so uh, there are not every uh, 911 specialist is going to have the capacity if she or he does not have access to good, reliable, fast uh, Wi-Fi or broadband service. So this is part of a MACO initiative mm -hmm. from the Association of Counties, and uh, and this is one of the real uh, needs to make this one a priority. So, uh, Randy, I assumed you you made this motion. Can we assume that? Correct. Make it okay. Is there is there a second on this? Sound or second. Without a second, thank you. Do we have discussion or questions? Discussion, uh, um, Senator. Uh, again, this is just a, a, a statement. This is not requesting codification of anything, correct? This is going to ultimately be one of the reasons why Maryland Association of Counties believes in the expansion of broadband access. It's for kids who need to learn and it's for public safety and many other reasons. So are we ready for thumbs? Okay, thumbs up if you're for recommendation number seven. Sean thumbs Lee. up. Tracy says thumbs up. Anna Sierra. Okay, I see Sean's thumb. All right, any opposed? Senator, I'm just, this is Anthony Myers. I'm saying because I'm not sure if this is being codified or just a general uh, statement. So for that reason, I'll abstain from the vote. Okay, I thought I answered that, but I obviously didn't well enough. Um, I'm trying to drive this train pretty fast because we still have two more subcommittees. Is there a recommendation number eight, Josh? There is. Okay. I don't know if Cecilia Warren is still on this uh, on the call, but uh, she may want to chime in on this next one on number eight. Please go ahead, Randy. So number eight is an update of House Bill 1024, uh, Senate Bill 847 from last year. Um, working with Cecilia, uh, we just basically clarified a couple of things. Um, so equipment is any device that can contact 911, i.e. computer application, peripheral device, et cetera, and include data file with the telephone facilities or equipment in the uses of malicious intent. Um, so again, a uh, very minor update to the uh, proposal, I guess, that went, that didn't get all the way through last year. Um, so I guess this would be a vote to codify um, and move this forward. Hey, Randy, are you making the motion? Yes, I make the motion. Is there a second? I will second it, uh, seeing no one else is going to do that now, because um, I'm quicker on the draw. Let me just clarify. Oh, Delegate Jackson will second it. Thank you. Uh, this is an amendment to legislation that we brought last year. Cecilia Warren from the Department of People with Disabilities uh, brought two, um, two important, but frankly, sort of, you know, these aren't going to radically change the bill, but uh, enhancements to the bill just to clarify and make more uh, inclusive exactly what some definitions are uh, in our bill so that we can come back with a with an even better bill in 2021. Mr. Myers, to be clear, this is legislation for sure and would amend legislation that this commission uh, approved last year. If there are no questions or comments on this one, can we go to thumbs? Okay. Thumbs up. Questions, thumbs up. All right, do we have Anna Sierra back yet? Tracy German, did I hear you? Yeah, thumbs up. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and it thumbs down. I see none. Thank you very much. Josh, is that? that is it. All yes. right, congratulations. Thank you to the Tech and Cyber Subcommittee. And next up is a joint presentation by Chief Brooks and me on behalf of the
finance and structure subcommittee along with the oversight and accountability subcommittee. And what we had time to deal with is representation on the board. I will give a backup, I mean, an overview, and then let's dive in. Um, Sherry is gonna share the screen on a slide that we have seen not big enough and way too often. <laughs> um, the last year's legislation, again, emphasizing legislation, had um, proposed modifications to who is on what was called then the Emergency Number Systems Board and now is called the 911 Board. There was a sentiment that not everyone who was in the current law fit on the board in a 911, a next gen 911 environment. There was also a sentiment that there were people who should be added to the board. That became more controversial than we might have wanted. So what we did was uh, removed that section, membership on the board section of the bill so that the greater good, which was the rest of the legislation could pass and was enacted. Two subcommittees have spent a lot of time debating and discussing what the membership on the board should look like. And the conversation had been about, let's not remove anyone who's currently on the board, let's just add. So with that, I can just toss it to, to Sherry, I can toss it to Chief Brooks, or is there any other background that anybody needs to try to Okay. I toss this to you, and if you can make the screen much bigger so that people can actually read it, that would be great. So everyone has the ability to adjust the view on their own. Um, I normally display. have that ability. I'm, I'm not seeing it for some reason right now. Your top right corner, there's a square and it's like just the corners are present. If you hover over that, it says enter full screen or you can hit alt and the F key and it'll take it to the full screen. Thank you very much, Heather. Okay, so thank you, Heather. Walk us through, and then Chief and I can answer questions, and then we will. Is it the pleasure of this group that we go slot by slot, motion by motion, or if we try to take this whole thing at once? That would be my preference, unless there are serious concerns about it. I'd love to be able to do this as one motion and move forward, so we can wrap up on time. But I defer to the to the group. We have twenty one minutes. One motion. One motion. Okay, let's see if we can do that. Um, so, and Tony Rose likes one motion. Sherry, let's start. Let's start with All right. a lot of no changes, mostly no change. Correct. So, as you were mentioning, this column represents the current board. And um, here in the second column, this is what is proposed um, right now. So as you can see, we have no change on the two association members, no change on the public member. Um, we had increased the, the two county representatives to be four PSAP directors. And we spelled out for you that we want one from each of the regions. So that is here, no change on police services. Sorry, Sherry, um, in that it was supposed to, so we want, I want to emphasize geographic and size diversity. Uh, geographic diversity is included by going with four different uh, regions, size diversity. We don't want all large or all small. Sherry, we were also going to consider uh, provider vendor diversity, that that was not going to be mandated, but since we are a multi-vendor state, we wouldn't want all to be one or all to be another. And vendors may change. So I don't think that needs to be in, we don't have to emphasize and we don't want to mandate because in the future, maybe all 24 are in one. So if we, Correct. that was supposed to be added. So if we can make sure that that is included, consider. We, we also were going to use local law enforcement versus just police services. Okay, we're not, we're not there yet, Sue. Yep. We're on, we're on PSA. So, so if you can um, just make sure that that's added, Sherry, in what in in the report and another. Okay, now we're on. Now yeah. we're on police. What? Right. So we. Sue, what language did you want? It's local law enforcement. 
Local, does that mean not Maryland State Police typically? No, no, we already have one for Maryland State Police. This is a separate one, it would be local law enforcement, which is your counties and city counties. Thank you. Thank you. Got that. Any objections? And so, yeah. Okay, I'm just renaming it. Mm hmm. Okay, go ahead, Sherry. No change on the Maryland State Police. On the emergency management services, there was a suggestion or uh, uh, we voted oh. mm -hmm. to, to reduce that from two representatives to one. And the reason for nope. that is that it was seen as duplicative, that there were a number of emergency representatives already on the, the board. The motion was from Captain Brillman, who is one of those uh, seats on the board. So go ahead, keep going. No change on the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services system. No change on the GIS, um, but to Delegate Kraft's point, we did rename that to be Maryland Department of Information Technology, GIS. Mm -hmm. No change on the two uh, fire representatives. We did uh, vote and approve to make the wireless telephone industry in the state a non-voting ex officio member. We also voted um, to make the telephone company operating in the state an ex officio non-voting member. There was no change to the Public Service Commission representative. And then, oh, I apologize. My screen jumped. Um, mm -hmm. And then these Okay, hold on, Sherry, are, we go to a new one. Any questions? Because we the goal is to do this in one motion. Any questions? On the, so on the, fire, the, on the fire department, just make sure it's specified look, um, volunteer and and career. I mean, it's it, it's not going to change from what it is today. Fine. Okay. No. Okay. Delegate Jackson, did you have? Did you did you just raise your hand? You're muted right now. You're still muted, Delegate Jackson. Can you unmute yourself? I'm sorry. No, I just said that it did it did indicate that on the. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So no questions, no other questions other than Delia Krebs. Let's move. Now there are five proposed recommended new members plus one additional non-voting member. So both subcommittees have approved. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do this, Sherry. Um, one cybersecurity expert, uh, one county finance representative, as we have on this commission. One, can we specify that? Can we, specify, that can we, Sorry, can we Clay? specify county, please, on that? Yes, please. We have that has been that should be clarified. Thank you. Um, a new uh, addition of an accessibility representative that is people with disabilities that is also non native English speakers. That's anyone who kind of is going to have insights and uh, perspectives that are otherwise not on the board. Uh, a new person that would be a a county 911 specialist as we have on this commission. Each of these are all on this commission and we have benefited from all of them. And then per Captain Brillman's um, note earlier, um, the Emergency Communications Commission from MACO, the Maryland Association of Counties would get one seat, which is why we reduced it above because it was seemed like that was duplicative. So that's clarifying it will come from the ECC and be that person. The last uh, person that was added at Mr. Stamp's suggestion, which we all supported, was a Maryland Emergency Management Agency, um, a non-voting seat on the floor on the board, and that would we were originally coming in potentially with a 24-member board. Mr. Myers raised the the very valid point that odd-number boards work better. While we've never seen sort of super close votes, it's still good practice. Um, and Deli Krebs was concerned about the size of the board. So we addressed both by coming in from 24, but reducing it to 21. So with that, are there questions? And I will make a motion to approve this chart with the yes. edits. I'll second that. Thank you, Aaron. Are there comments or questions or can we go to thumbs? Thumbs. Thumbs, thumbs. Chief Brooks. Oh. All right. I see. Uh, okay. 
Thumb, any thumbs down? I thumb. Tony Rose has a thumbs down. Tony, do you want to speak briefly as to why your thumb is down? No, because it's it's not a short discussion and you're pressed for time. Okay. I love you for that. May I say that? Thank you. Uh, so consensus, but not unanimous, that, uh, that this will be um, brought forward into the draft report moving forward. The chart will be much prettier when, it, when you see it again, and, uh, and we'll make sure that wording is, is uh, reassuring and copacetic for everybody moving so forward. So, Senator, I know you're moving fast, but, you know, Tony, I mean, it's really important that we know what Tony's concern is. I mean... Tony, your public wants to know. Same concerns that I had last session when we when we uh, when we went through this exercise, and and that is um, my concern about the fire department has two seats on the board, the police department has two seats on the board. Up until this current change, emergency management had two seats on this board. I'm not sure I understand why it is necessary for those agencies to have that much representation on this board. Everybody else has one slot. And I never, I've never got an answer to that question. Why is it necessary for there to be two fire department representatives, two police agency representatives? So Tony, I just want to flag for you. Sherry has the chart in exactly the right place here. If you can highlight Last year's commission and last year's legislation did propose to reduce those numbers. Um, if you see, no, Sherry, down to please. Fire, um, last year's commission report and legislation. Sherry, uh, recommended a change to combine the two fire service representatives into one position. That was the case. You've seen that exact same language elsewhere on this chart. It had been discussed it had been proposed, it had been approved by this commission, the legislation came in that way, there was concern, there was some political opposition, and rather than fight that battle again, um, the consensus was the greater good was adding the people who are not currently in the room, rather than fighting the battle over, you know, kicking people off the board. That's... And Cheryl, the way I look at it, there are two emergency management people. One is the, from the um, makeup, Group and one is just emergency management. The way I, I think, I, I can't see the whole chart at the same time. I know. But I, I think there are two emergency management systems. It's just one of them is specific to the make, I think. Right. The and then there are now four SAP, there would be four PSAP representatives, Tony, which I think is important and, uh, and a really good development. And so that will give disproportionate weight or appropriate weight to really the experts who are in this every day. So I guess I would say we tried. And at some point, I think the commission a little bit waved a white flag and we're fighting different battles. That would be my answer. Clay, does that answer your? No, I, that, I mean, his voice is important and he makes sense. I understand it. Um, and so in the spirit of trying to find consensus, um, I, in my mind, this, this chart, you know, kind of reaches all the constituents and uh, well-rounded and it has strong local representation, which is critically important to me because we've had a great uh, history of 911 in Maryland because it's a locally led system and right. we don't want to lose that. Um, so, I mean, I think there's been a lot of compromise here, but at the end of the day, I can live with this. So Sherry, if you could highlight here the Department of State Police, Maryland State Police, if you could highlight that line four there. Um, it says, Tony, last year's commission report and legislation uh, recommended removal of this representation, of this representative. So it's just, we're not gonna fight that battle now unless you wanna propose an amendment. No, nope, I'm but, good, keep going. Okay, okay. I appreciate your comments as always. Thank you, Clay. Thank you for pushing us to do that. Um, I'm flagging that it's 2.50. Um, Sherry, I think this wraps up the joint committee's work. And then we have more, but I, we had more on the agenda and more to do. Um, there are three other issues that I'd like to talk about literally one minute each, but we are not going to vote. We do not have verbiage, but I wanna make sure that they are presented in public. And then we will take the last three minutes to talk about the process of moving forward the next meeting and 
the uh, process of um, and the timetable on things. So I'll toss that to Molly after I'm done. Is that an okay? Can I see some nodding as to that so that we can adjourn on time? Okay, thank you. Yes, John. Okay, one minute on each of three. 311, uh, Finance and Structure Subcommittee is gonna have a conversation, is continuing its conversation, whether there should be one statewide 311. There are six or seven counties that already have locals, others either can't afford it or aren't aware of whether there's a demand. Um, there's, a, there's a question of, of how that could work and what the benefits could be for staffing and training um, in terms of finding a new 911 specialist, helping him have ex experience and providing better customer service. That's one. The second issue um, is about procurement. There is a question now that the 911 is more than twice as much money as it used to have. Um, I have talked to a number of procurement experts as to what the process should look like. There is strong consensus that the way it has gone for many years is not appropriate. Um, and it has been slid under the radar screen, but everything is more visible now during COVID. The question is, how do we do procurement in a way that helps save lives, doesn't slow down the process, doesn't get people who have no expertise uh, to be looking over the shoulder and, uh, and messing things up. So we're trying to find the common ground. <coughs> Henry from Mission Critical has provided some great work on from other states and I've talked to a lot of people. We will be talking about that in the future. And the third issue, Sherry, is where the 911 board should be housed. That has been something that we have talked about briefly um, over now several years. There, uh, there are still a conversation that is ongoing. Again, we do not have language and we will not be voting on that today. So that is the brief overview of three issues that we will be working on in subcommittees and will be discussing at the November meeting. With that, I toss it to Molly to wrap up the timetable and go from there. And have Sure, I just wanna make sure I I think I saw um, Kevin's hand raised. Was that intentional or Kevin Canale? No, sorry, okay. that was a, that was a while back. No worries. Thank you. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do after today, um, and so a lot of good discussion today. Still a lot to be done and uh, prepped in advance of the next commission meeting, which is Wednesday, November 18th. In the meantime, for some of our topics um, that we have, you know, well underway, we can, MCP will start drafting. Uh, so we are looking to have kind of our subcommittee draft. The way this will work is we will draft con uh, report content, review it with the subcommittees, and then, um, you know, and then, add in any final additional recommendation language uh, and content surrounding those the remaining items. Um, so it may not go, we may not have as much as I thought by the sixth at this point after today, but we will, uh, we will get there by the 18th uh, so that folks can have time to review the content of the report. We will then, we have until December 15th for the final report. I am shooting for a Friday, December 11th for final, final, final. Um, so after that commission, um, our commission meeting on the 18th, MCP will pull it all together and uh, everyone will see a draft before it is finalized. So okay. it, Thank that you. Is, it's going to be aggressive. It's going to be aggressive as it has been for each of the last three years. So um, I want to thank you all for your participation and engagement today. This was more challenging and had more uh, more pushback on some of the stuff that I think some of us thought might be not so controversial. So I think the subcommittees are gonna be busy. I really implore you to make time to be on your subcommittee or another subcommittee and another subcommittee, if you can, if you want, if you've got expertise or opinions, please engage because at some point it is really hard to legislate and debate when there are this many people. It's much easier in our subcommittees if we've got five, six, eight people. So please, please, please engage and share your concerns or questions in advance so that we can move forward and continue our 
track record of really making a difference and moving forward towards next generation 911. Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Souter, questions, thoughts, remarks? No comments except to say thank you to everybody for being engaged and loving this passion uh, the way we all do. Yes, okay. Delegate Krebs, Delegate Jackson, you good? Thank you both. Thank you for, for attending and staying engaged and for all you do. Um, Randy, thank you for your leadership for stepping in uh, as a new subcommittee chair. And then uh, Shar, Flaherty, Chief Brooks, thank you for your continued leadership uh, of your subcommittees. I think that's where the action is. And so we will continue that. Um, before we adjourn, if, uh, if I can see as many faces as possible, let's take a quick photo. If you wanna look into your screen and let's take a picture since we can't do it in person. Uh, look into your screen, smile. All right, uh, thank you all uh, for everything. Thanks to my staff, thanks to Mission Critical and uh, thanks to Mr. Roper, Mr. Myers and uh, for all that you do. Okay, take care all, stay safe. We'll see you again soon. Thank Bye. you, take care everyone.